Well, hello everybody. So this is actually quite a momentous occasion because it's the very first like full scale collab I've done with another creator. And it just so happens to be this particular creator. Hello. <laughs> I, he should need no introduction. Uh, I'm Anamaki History, obviously it's my channel. So, but uh, mm -hmm. you want to introduce yourself anyway, because well, everyone needs to know. <laughs> uh, I'm Drake. I am Drakinifel of the channel of the same name. Um, I do naval history, so there is obviously a little bit of an overlap here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little bit of one, a little bit of one, though uh, as well, our conversation before stream started or before recording started is our interests are very aligned, although I think this kind of hobby just sort of attracts our kind of people to be honest. Yes. Um, but yes, the king of naval history YouTube is with us, mm -hmm. and it is also, <laughs> it's a momentous occasion for your subscribers, because now we get the official... Drakinifel party policy on waifus or boat waifus. <laughs> the official. Because, like, I've, I've got... I think more... I've been a half years dodging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's been dodging it all this time. He's got... His Discord has the cancer corner, but now it's time. Now it's time. Yeah. For... It's time for the... Uh... I would make a, uh, a British political joke given the situation, but I think it... <laughs> In both our countries, things are pretty wild right now, so... <laughs> we best... uh, yeah, I th I th I th I, well, I, my, my current working theory is for the past 30 years, the, the main prim qualification to be Prime Minister of the UK is your IQ must be half or less that of the outgoing Prime Minister. Right, yeah, I think the same thing. So it's just well. exponentially decreasing. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've had a bit of a rally in recent times, but our last mm. one went on holiday during a national crisis twice so like yeah, you know <laughs> yeah but it's i mean yeah. <laughs> the, the, the queen saw who was going to become prime minister and died and she was immortal <laughs> so <laughs> okay so before we get into real trouble it's now for the drakinafel yeah. party platform of of the stance the official stance on boat waifu which is a um <laughs> Which is a contentious topic, because I, I mm. get a lot of comments. I get a lot of comments on my videos, like, oh, I never thought Drakinafel would consider doing any Azure Lane content. And I know you've mm -hmm. avoided breaching the subject like the plague on your yeah. own channel for the same reason, because serious military history buffs and people over the age of, like, 30, and even mm. nutcases below the age of 30 are sort of like, they see cute Japanese girls attached to anything like keep it away yeah yeah <laughs> but uh now's the time so i just kind of want to do what i'm doing i'm also assembling a mm -hmm. girls and panzer documentary along the same lines with some other creators so that's fun so i'm gonna ask the same yeah. question of you that i ask of them which is i want your take on boat waifus i want to i want to hear the drakinafel take on the whole boat um, waifu phenomenon <laughs> i mean it's it's obviously it's not something that that I particularly go for, but I I tend to take if I, I think I have two two main views on it. One of which is the more general one, which is you know if it's getting people interested in naval history in some way, shape, or form, then th there there's got to be something beneficial about it. Mm. You know, ev everyone gets into a hobby or an interest in some way, shape, or form. You know, and and it's not always the same for everyone. And you know, if 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 a bunch of random Japanese anime is what it takes people to get interested in interest in World One, World War Two naval history, then so be it. As long as I I kind of apply the same same logic I do to the rest of things in life. As long as people don't come in, you know, screaming and obnoxious and mono focused on it, hundred percent of the time. I'm like, whatever, <laughs> you do you. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not one of these kind of yeah you know, get get the unholy things away from me, but uh, as evidenced by the fact I'm here in the first place. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of 
yeah, you, you do your thing and I'll kind of watch here from the sidelines usually. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and the, I think the only other thing would be that o over the years, I've come to the theory that you find historical accuracy in the most surprising places. Yeah, you do. Which is one of the um, big themes so, of this yeah, whole thing. Like, yeah. They, 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 I, as far as I'm aware, there's a few different, I don't know even what they're called, genres, series, yeah, uh, whatever, um, that all follow this same kind of trend. Um, but from from the, my limited understanding, I, I have noticed a few things. I'm like, ah, someone actually paid attention to their history, if not necessarily first, at least a very close second to drawing random anime girls, <laughs> which... It surprises me, um, although it's surprising me less and less as time goes on. I mean, you see the same thing with historical movies, you know. Um, but an example I, I like to usually point out is I don't don't know if you saw the Midway movie, the more recent one. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that's ostensibly supposed to be a historical movie about Midway and the events leading up to it, and then you've got the Kingsman movie. The prequel again, relatively recent. I don't know if you saw that one with. Didn't Rasputin, get a chance to see that, but I saw sort of Rasputin teaming up with Hitler kind of clips and stuff like yeah. that. I was like, I mean, I vibe, but why? Yeah. <laughs> well, and see, so, so this is the thing, right? <laughs> um, where the Kingsman movie, um, the prequel one set in World War One, where it actually touches on real history. It's surprisingly spot on. Like they've got a bit about the you know, vague spoiler alert. They've got a bit about the sinking of HMS Hampshire and the death of Lord Kitchener. When and okay, fair enough. I'm a bit of a naval geek, but when HMS Hampshire came on screen, I was like, "Huh, that's Hampshire." And immediately my mind went, "My mind went, I know exactly what's going to happen," and it did. I mean, obviously, they put their own slight twist on it, but whoever was in charge of that movie, or whoever was in charge of that scene, at least, cared enough to make an accurate representation of Hampshire uh, as her, you know, as an as a cruiser, and not just reach for generic off-the-shelf World War One ship model. Yeah. Um, and and the same thing with things in that movie with things like the Zimmerman telegram or even some of the depictions of trench warfare. I was like, this is actually, you know, for the for the historical elements they're including, pretty spot on. And then you look at something like Midway, which has a much larger budget and is supposed to be all about accurate history, and suddenly you discover Japan has like nine Yamatos and mighty Morphin power congos that can transform into destroyers and back again <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, every carrier in the US is a Yorktown class and every ship at Pearl Harbor was a Pennsylvania class and did you know Arizona exploded three ways none of which were actually realistic to how it actually blew up so when you're when you're looking at the Michael Bay mid Pearl Harbor movie and going that was more accurate you know than as in its depiction of the Pearl Harbor attack than Midway was you, it's mm. just like yeah mm. um I, I, so i kind of like the way midway sort of did it it kind of did this sort of like the big things were mm. right and the sort of chronology was kind of right and i'm like you did a better job there with a lot of other movies on similar topics but yeah like, the uh, well, the, the, execution yeah, I... <laughs> Yeah, the chronology was there, and and some of the some of it, like they like they they got the bomb hits on the Japanese carriers, like almost to the yard perfect. But then it's simultaneously accompanied by like what I I like to call the Battlestar Kaga, <laughs> um, where it's like it, you could have you could have walked down to Kaga on the amount of metal that was being thrown <laughs> up in that AA sequence. Like the Japanese wish they had that. <laughs> yeah, I, I said the same thing. I was like, man. Man, if they had that AA, like, the amount of fire they were putting out, I'm like, you had to manually reload those guns, and it was a magazine yeah. system, too. Like, mm. you, you're like, some poor guy, like, you fire 20 rounds, you're like, okay, here's another one, here's another one. Mm. It's, it's one of those great things about the Japanese films, um, like, uh, the... What was it? The Archimedes, the battle with Archimedes, the war against Archimedes, or whatever. oh yeah, war of Archimedes, yes, yeah, with Yamato. Like, I yeah. saw the Yamato scenes in that, and I was like, that is, mm. that is 
Yes. Like, they, they, they seem to do their, like, I looked at Midway, and I was wondering why they had, the, like, they did the same thing that, um, uh, another thing I've railed against, Call mm. of Duty Vanguard did the same thing, which was, mm. like, why do all the Japanese carriers have their tower on the left-hand side when only two, like, only Hiryu yeah. and Akagi did? Everyone else. But no, they all have it on the left-hand side. <laughs> like, yeah. Japanese it's, carriers it's, have it's, it on the left, so... There was just there was just so much stuff in there, and it's like as you say, there's there's some accurate stuff, and it's almost like they had two, I guess maybe the A element and the B element of filming, and one element was paying extra close attention to detail, and the other element was just like oh, I don't know, we can't be bothered to splash out for more than one carrier model for the U.S. fleet or one cruiser model. One, it's like they literally <laughs> bought one cruiser, one battleship, one carrier. It's like everything is that. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I'm not even American, and I felt personally, I felt offended on behalf of Americans for the Pearl Harbor attack sequence, because it's like the whole, po well, not the whole point, but the, the main thing everyone knows about Pearl Harbor is Arizona, and they couldn't get that right. Yeah. When that, that's one of the few things that the Michael Bay movie got right, and they blew up a bunch of modern frigates halfway through that attack sequence for no reason. <laughs> Again, I guess it's just a, a discussion of our focuses because you're a Navy guy. I'm, mm. I, I ended up doing Azure Lane by accident. I ended up mm -hmm. doing Naval History by accident because you can see the airplanes behind me. I, yeah. I just sort of fell into it because I was like, I made Strike Witch's content and Katakawa mm -hmm. brought down the hammer of God upon me because they <laughs> own that franchise and they saw me posting Strike Witch's content and they're like, no, mm. no, 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 you can't post that. I was like, what am I going to do now? And I was like, oh, I'll make a video about Prince Eugen, which is horrible. You shouldn't watch that. I make so many errors. <laughs> watch my Bismarck one instead. It's a lot better. Um, but, but, like, it's funny. I sort of, even I was looking at it, I'm like, yo, they remade it. They, they actually built a mock-up Devastator. And I was like, wow, that's commitment. And the SPD was yeah. everything right. And, and then I, I remember, I saw them flying over the Japanese fleet. And I was like, oh my God, it's going to be epic. And then I'm like, is that like four Yamatos? Like, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, I think it's just the it's it's the same thing that happened with Call of Duty Vanguard, ironically, which is um mm. like one team one team did the script writing and all of the sort of historical consultancy and all that sort of thing, which was great. And then the the effects and rendering team just went ham. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and i mean to be honest you see that across so many franchises these days and it's so heartbreakingly disappointing i mean i'm i i consider myself a general sci-fi fan but i don't know if you watched the if you've watched star trek picard at all yeah oh my God. right so you remember the season one ending sequence <sighs> where it was like here 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 are four variations of the same ship control c control p v across the screen and then within like a week a couple of guys with a relatively powerful gaming pc had put together a like a, f a full 4k <laughs> color lighting motion tracking matched sequence using a bunch of like first contact late ds9 era late voyager era ships yeah and yeah. it just looked so much better oh. and it's like it was almost a Tony Stark mode. It's like they they almost literally like compared to the VFX studios they've got in in Hollywood. It's like they literally put that together with a box of scraps in a cave, and you could splice it into the original episode and be going, "This is so much better." Yeah, because you've got you've got freaking like old galaxy classes like that are still pottering mm. around. You've got nebulas. You've got all the good stuff. You've got some. You've got even got some Excelsior classes out. There. Um, mm. It's like it's really good stuff, but mm. it brings us all back to the main discussion, which yes. is boat waifus or anthropomorphism mm. in Japanese culture in general. <laughs> and we have yes. it is a big thing. It is a big thing. And I thought the thing that really got me, that really sort of made me pick this method of t of teaching history above mm -hmm. all others, is a um forgive me forgive me children if there's anyone under 18 you shouldn't be here anyway but if there are mm. any people under 18 turn away now but anime titty sells like it does mm -hmm. if i put a cute anime girl on something people will click like yes i made a bias. Yeah, i was gonna say you, you can do attract the teenage demographic quite easily that way yeah like my documentary on hansi akim marseille like i put the strike witches version 
with you know a luger or a walther p38 technically mm. like with a spare magazine hanging out of a panty line looking all sexy mm. and cool and like at least fifty thousand clicks on that video what yo can i get a source for that thumbnail bro can can you tell me who that is and i'm like stay for the history it's good man like yeah I'll, I'll give you the waifu but just stay for the history the other thing is i feel like it's a weird thing with ship girls and i and the reason why i say that is ship girls like when you think of, you've got like plane franchises you've got girly air mm-hmm. force you've got which don't watch under any circumstances you've got strike witches my favorite up there you've got all kinds of different series that sort of tackle this sort of theme but it always circles back to naval history ship girls like mm. you've got like strike witches is the only big a- aviation franchise and it's not even the planes it's the real life fighter aces who have been gender bent or the law mm. says they're alternate universes with the same names but gender Fair enough. you're turning fighter aces into waifus it's mm-hmm. fair. okay whatever whatever does it for you right but you've got that you've got girls in panzer which you can't really anthropomorphize a tank unless you're doing like fan art stuff which again mm. huge market but you can have cute girls driving tanks and then when you look at girls in panzer like the cute waifu stuff it's a sport where nobody dies we have tank battles but nobody mm. dies like no yeah it's never gonna happen right but the cute girls doing cute things gives you the excuse to have a fully accurately modeled tiger tank with the interiors perfectly done everything's perfectly done mm. like yeah they go twice as fast as they should and their turrets rotate like a leopard twos but the model and everything and how it's operated and the tactics they use are really cool so it's like okay but there's only one franchise in the aviation side which is strike which is a one in the tank side which is girls and panzer whereas mm. the naval history scene has several battling it out for dominance and there are several different groups like the two biggest are of course kantai collection and azure lane um and then of course you've got arpeggio of blue steel and warship girls which um so like and i think the big thing is what we were talking about before we started recording which is like when you're trying to teach history like when you're talking about like if you've got a fictional thing you can say oh it did this cool thing and it can do this and it's you know like we were talking about 40k or like in yeah. any other thing you can do like star trek is the same like yeah the galaxy class did this and you can talk about the history of the enterprise and up left corner gang um mm-hmm. but the thing is with naval history with this method the way i've sort of done it in my videos is i don't write about the because sh- i've got the waifu on screen i don't write mm. about the ship as a ship i write about it as a person mm-hmm. so i use she and person and like personal pronouns yeah. for the ship and by humanizing or anthropomorphizing the ship and all the other characters it turns from like a uh, simple dry history documentary to kind of like a um like a sort of i don't know lack of a better term what's hot right now like game of thrones kind of thing where yeah enterprise and akagi and zukaku and bismarck and prince wagon they're not they're not these battleships created by political leaders who are doing imperialistic ambitions they are characters in a rpg or a story and they're having grand Mm -hmm. epic battles and so when they die or when there's a huge battle you feel the emotional impact as if it was happening to a person rather than a ship and so i think that's why ship girls have a bit more pull in the sort of i think i yeah I, i think cult culturally as well i think it probably lends itself a bit more to it because let's face it a tank a plane etc they usually don't last very long yeah. You know the the from 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 first production to obsolescence, especially in World War One, World War Two, is a matter of years. And the individual aircraft, they're all much of a muchness. Like you know, if you've got, and there's going to be quite a few of them involved. So if you're going to have like a Battle of Britain type thing, like okay, well there's like fifty Spitfires and a hundred Hurricanes and one hundred and fifty BF one hundred nines. That's a lot of individual units that are approximately all clones of each other yeah and you know and and their their fights don't last very long yeah like uh, uh, the uh, realistic aerial dogfight or tank battle is a few minutes at most usually a 
tens of seconds and then the, and then they're gone that it's destroyed and that's it which doesn't probably it doesn't make for very compelling storytelling but no, it doesn't. especially when you when you're looking at world war ii when you've got a lot of holdover ships from world war one these ships have history they've been around for uh, decades in some cases so there's a lot more history to them to build you and you can use that i suppose to build up characterization yes. um you know if, like war spike keeps hitting things by accident <laughs> um in real life so it's like you could you could if you were going to anthropomorphize that you could then you know go, okay well we're going to make the character slight, slightly clumsy and just keeps bashing into things but comes out of it okay um it's funny you mention that because that is a topic that's going to come up a lot when we go through the waifus we've got here because they've mm. all got the azure lane i think does that better than anything else which is why i've got the azure lane focus because Azure Lane has this really great thing where in their character design, you can probably see with Enterprise in the mm. top left corner here, mm. like their history and the story of the ship and their ship's design is reflected on the character design itself. Yeah. Um, which is one which thing. Which is quite handy, yeah. It's one thing that really helps them along. But you're right. It, it The way I've sort of written my Enterprise series is sort of from that, mm. it's kind of from that method because... When you tell, when you, like, when you read, because you've had, you've done a video, you did a massive seminar with Jonathan Partial, was it? Who did Shadow yeah. Sword? Dude. Yeah. Amazing. His book is one of my favorite books I've ever read. But mm -hmm. the way he sort of, like, dramatizes it and tells it from the admirals and stuff's perspectives, what you can do is you can take that and then you sort of, as I was sort of saying before, you kind of mm. do that. And so... When Enterprise and Zukaku keep meeting each other, which is a theme in the anime and the story and the game and stuff like that, when they mm. keep meeting each other in the series I've written, you can write it not as like, you can write it like the old sort of samurai movies in a sort of weird yeah. way. Like, you know, every time Enterprise thinks she's got the upper hand and she's coming back in and she's going to save the day once again, Zukaku and her sister are there and there's a huge mm. battle and it's like, oh, we meet again, we're the adversary. And it does, Yeah, you can sort of, the ca the ships become people themselves even i mean people have been yeah, doing that to ships for years for centuries yeah i mean sh ships in western culture at least are female yeah so it, it, again culturally it, it makes uh, the jump slightly easier and as you say like the battles with with most naval battles take you know tens of minutes if not hours and it's ba it's a constant back and forth and yeah occasionally you'll get something short sharp and dramatic like bismarck versus hood but most of the time it's a proper knockdown drag out fight which means that i suppose yeah, if you're trying to anthropomorphize it you can then turn it into this epic duel yeah where both sides are getting the advantage and then not not getting the advantage and if there's an eventual winner which is much much easier to then i suppose edit down into a story of two people fighting as opposed to two ships fighting or whatever yeah. um as opposed to you know if you yeah but as you say like with tanks and planes and stuff where it's like you know tank a versus tank b one of them fired from concealment tank b died the end <laughs> like that's why i think the smart decision when talking about aviation history is to focus on the aviators themselves which is quite weird. yeah it's just much easier to tell the story that way because mm. you, you you only get emotional responses from people when you're talking about other like mm. or and a ship I think the reason why we love it so is that a ship has a story. Every ship has a story, really. It doesn't matter how long or short it is. They've all got one. Um, and they've all got their own features and personalities. Like, a class of ship, like, like, every class of ship can be the same, but each one of them has variations and differentiations from battle damage and stuff like that and where they were and what they did. So it's... There's also revisions to design, like... The Yorktown class, I don't think all three, across all three of the Yorktowns, I don't think all of them were the same design completely. No. Hornet, if you line the three up, Hornet is immediately identifiable. She's very visually distinct in profile. Um, Enterprise and Yorktown, it's slightly harder to tell apart um, because they were, they were built at the same time, whereas Hornet was built, built to slightly modified design a few years later. Um, but if you look a little bit closer, you can tell the difference. Uh, be between Enterprise and Yorktown, uh, which of course gets slightly easier as the war goes on because Enterprise is the only one left. So if you see a picture of a Yorktown class carrier that's festooned with radar and 
uh, you know, Hellcats and everything. That's like, well, the, yeah, that's by process of elimination enterprise. <laughs> Made my editing job easier for Enterprise Part 3 and the upcoming Part 4 because because I'm using color footage and stuff. I'm like, if I'm looking at Task Force 58, I know for a fact that if I see a Yorktown, it has to be Enterprise. It can only mm. be. Which is really sad, but at the same time, yeah. uh, the fact that they scrapped that thing is a crime, but that's a rant we'll go on for a million yeah. years. But speaking of Enterprise, there she mm. is, top left corner on our screen mm -hmm. here. You can see the stream. What do you think? Yep. Well, I mean, it's as you said, like in in this picture, they've incorporated the the superstructure into what looks like a double string bow. Yeah. So that makes it fairly easy to. I mean, you know, again, you have to be something of a, a naval history buff to, to recognize it, but that's immediately recognizable as well. E even at the first stretch, that's American. The the yeah. funnel, <laughs> the big long funnel, that's American. Um, and then you just look at some of the other stuff. Okay, right, Yorktown class carrier. Um, then you've got the the bald eagle coming in up there as well. Uh, and it's just like, okay, you you know, immediately this is putting me in mind of Enterprise because, uh, like, apart from anything else, apart from the paraphernalia, the, the little uh, badge on the tie, etc., it, it's immediate. It's kind of locked it down because, yeah, if you if you're gonna characterize what's obviously from from the bow clearly a, a yorktown class carrier the only one you're going to put america's national symbol on is going to be enterprise you'd think but it's kind of uh, they they share the grim reaper between uh, enterprise mm -hmm. and yorktown um mm. but what i thought was interesting is um on enterprise's bow you can see her trademark tripod bridge on the front of the yeah on the front of yeah. the boat, which I thought was really interesting as a design, mm -hmm. but we'll we'll get along with some of the others here. Mm -hmm. So what do we got here? Let's uh, bring up. I uh, some of I wanted to go through each of them individually, but then we'd be here all week. So mm -hmm. I decided yeah. to get a couple of um like consolidations, shall we call it? So mm -hmm. let's bring up. Well, we we started doing the Yorktown sisters, so let's go through the Yorktown, shall we? Mm -hmm. We bring up there we go Hornet, There's... of course oh yeah so they've got you've got a uh that's so yeah they've they've taken a riff off the doolittle raid for this picture yeah hornet special ability in the game mm -hmm. is to launch b25s always easy. yeah same as world of warships ironically enough mm -hmm. um but well, i should actually play my hornet at some point <laughs> <laughs> i i bought it i i i wanted to buy enterprise but they don't sell her anymore so i had to mm. I could only get one Yorktown, which is Hornet. Mm. And you've also got Hornet's distinct, as you can see, Hornet's distinct sort of design layout on her deck. Because as you can see, mm -hmm. on their battle gear, you can see they've got their their carrier deck. Bits of the ship, yeah. yeah. Alongside. I do like Hornet's design primarily because of, like, you know, they've got the um, black and yellow sort of wasp Hornet kind of look. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. B25, and you've got the sort of deck... The, the different deck designs you've got en you've got enterprise mm -hmm. and see if i can find yorktown i do have yorktown in here it would be under what yeah we go but that's z23 so we'll do her next but there you go mm -hmm. there's yorktown and there mm -hmm. you go you can see the same sort of the same sort of look yeah i think that's also interesting that they've made um like hairstyles and stuff and to a certain extent, even dress styles between Yorktown and Enterprise are a lot more similar. Hornet's kind of the one that stands out, which is historically accurate. As I said earlier, Hornet's visual profile is very different, very different from her two sisters, and it's a younger ship. Yeah, yeah, and uh, sort of, and yeah, this, the character sort of archetypes do sort of follow with that. Yorktown very much acts as an older sister um she does which is yeah, she's the first of the class so she she does act like that like that um but we got a glimpse of her so i'll just mm -hmm. click it over here we have everyone's favorite <laughs> krieg's marine destroyer z23 it, this is this is the bit where you where where you start wondering if you're going to go to jail <laughs> yeah <laughs> um <laughs> Yes, that that's one of the most contentious debates 
Um, mm -hmm. The way they've sort of set it up in Azure Lane law because of uh, dubious uh, <laughs> dubious laws regarding ages of consent mm. in Japan. Um, the destroyers are all what what the weeb community would call lolis. They're younger. Mm -hmm. They're all younger. So the destroyers are kids. Uh, okay, so, so they're basic. They're basically scaled. I guess basically scaled displacement with age. Um, kind. So if you're if you're if you're a small if you're a small ship like a destroyer, you're you're a kid, and if you're a big ship like a battleship or a carrier, you're older. You would think so, but then some of the battleships are smaller, and then mm -hmm. are younger, and then some like it's it's a weird rule. But on the whole, the destroyers. Okay. Are, we sort of like I I go by the rule, no destroyers, but Z twenty three mm. is the is probably the least egregious. Of them. There this, a... this suddenly this suddenly makes me makes me joyous that I haven't dived too deep into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there is a dark place, you I'm telling you, I'm on safe boru for these, my guy. I'm on safe boru. Mm. Like if I go onto Gelb or Danboro, like some of the other anime image searches, um I will find all manner of our favorite uh, naval vessels in certain compromising positions. Um weebs must be stopped. Like I am Yes, I am so. Well, there's a reason. There's a reason that there's a reason where they're confined to one place on the on my Discord <laughs> server. <laughs> the cancer corner. It's yeah. actually called the cancer corner. Um, you you've got to stop the infection before it spreads. Um, yeah. <laughs> but we go from that. So this is what I'm talking about. You think the rule applies? Mm. You would think the rule applies universally, but no, mm. it does not. Oh dear. Mm. <laughs> Did you happen to catch the name of what that ship is? <laughs> yes. Yeah, the war spike. I mean, I like the sword. Yeah, the sword is great. This is the thing. Her special ability in the game and the anime is, of course, shooting from long range. Because mm -hmm. she has the longest shot. And she's also got yeah. the sword. But as you can see, that, char that character design, I am probably going to have to do some uh, blurring mm -hmm. after edit there. Yeah, I yeah, that's mm. definitely gonna have to happen. <laughs> the look of... think, again, this is this is the kind of like this is the fascinating thing of that someone's gone through the trouble of doing a a, a reasonably decent job of modeling a fifteen inch twin turret. <laughs> you just sort of look at it, you're like, what did they do to the grand old lady? Like, what did they yeah. do to her? Like. <laughs> This is this is the biggest gripe I have with Azure Lane, this character right here. I mm. I wanted Warspite to be the grand old lady. I wanted her to be like like six foot with like a long ball gown and like the Union mm. Jack as a cape. But <laughs> <laughs> but no, instead that role went to my favorite my favorite of the girls. And Relentless Stan for the chat, here we go. Good. HMS Hood. Yes. Now that that I like. Thank you. You see, I... King of Naval History YouTube is a man mm -hmm. of culture, right here. <laughs> HMS Hood. I really like my favorite thing about HMS Hood's design is you can see that her sort of like um, um, you know, like uh, racing, like going to the races hat yeah. as Hood's superstructure. Yeah, that's what was in my head. I was just <laughs> looking at it. I was like, that's it's it's the, it's the superstructure. <laughs> <laughs> She has a sort and, of racing day mm, bonnet with a with hood yeah. structure, and the guns are of course accurately modelled to hood. Itself. Yeah, this casement uh, casement gun down there because she, she had the five point fives originally. Mm -hmm. Like she looks, Hood's design has got to be. Right. She just looks really yeah. Cool. Like especially this art of her. Like her design is my favourite, and of course she is always seen with a cup of tea when not fighting aliens so mm -hmm. always important which we then switch to her arch nemesis there we go now this one's a bit of um it, it i i chose a bit of a stylized one because i really like yeah the design for this one hmm. but you can it's got that sh shark shark tooth motif over there that Z23 had as well. Is that something they have common in the Kriegsmarine yeah, artwork? The, the Kriegsmarine ships do have do have a sort of shark sort of attachment, but mm -hmm. 
I sort of like Bismarck's design for how her gear is sort of set up. She, mm -hmm. she's kind of like the one thing they do accurately model for most of these ships is the guns. Mm -hmm. They always seem to get the guns right, but I do like that she's got the sort of Atlantic stripe or the sort of was it the Baltic stripe yeah. actually? It's the, the yeah the Baltic stripes yeah the Baltic stripes for the uh, for the superstructure on the back there, and they've got her bridge and her radar mm -hmm. set which she. Uh, knocked out the first time she <laughs> fired her guns i mean yeah. your recent video on that one was uh quite an epic uh quite an epic oh event. yeah the, the the one about the james cameron expedition i ba i basically just got for that i just got fed up of okay like going through comments and just seeing you know bismarck was was never was was never damaged by the british because of james Cam cameron and it was just it wasn't even like people presenting a coherent point of view it was literally like like what what are you five it was literally that the comment was like bismarck wasn't sunk by british because james cameron i was like you're missing so much grammar and syntax out of that <laughs> it's like but but I, I was I was tempted at one point to go. This must be a bunch of, of you know, non English speakers trying to spam the chat. And that, but then I was like, no, actually, to be perfectly honest, I'm pretty sure like ninety nine percent of Germans <laughs> would be able to construct a more coherent sentence than that. It's literally the sentence of either a five year old or someone who's making up things by slamming their head on the keyboard until random words pop out. Look, I hate to break it to most of our American viewers, but the Germans speak better English than you. Like, really, <laughs> they're they're like every German I've met speaks better English mm. than me. Um, disreputable well, to be fair, like half of the language is English. Is, is <laughs> half of English is German? So, <laughs> I mean that is, that is a good point. We use the same grammar structure, so it's just sort of yeah. it's a bit easier to learn to sort of cross between them. But yeah, I always found the most interesting thing about the Bismarck is that the biggest compelling argument I found for the whole scuttled thing, mm -hmm. which is the thing about that argument is it's all about pride. It's literally an ego. Yes. It's an ego thumping. Like there was no way Bismarck was going to survive being cornered by home fleet. There is yeah. no way. But as far as I'm aware, like all the watertight doors were open and they, they were in the process of scuttling her and it just sort of flooded and she just went over and just... yeah yeah i mean spoiler alert i am working on a video that's going to address that and me trying to reconstruct the timelines to work out what exactly is plausible and what isn't um the the the, the problem one of the problems you know trying to determine what actually happened to bismarck is that as you say yeah all the watertight doors are open but that's also standard procedure when you're abandoning ship yeah because if you go abandon ship people are going to open the doors to get out nobody who's in the process of abandoning ship is going to turn around and go you know what i'm going to shut every door behind me as i go <laughs> <laughs> i mean apart from anything like all the people following them are just going to then probably kill them but um <laughs> yeah how, how do you know you're the last one out and also if you're abandoning ship does it matter that whether the door is shut behind you not really it's just like um, manners just hold open the bulkhead like after you please okay, yeah i just need to make sure the compartment we i can't remember like there's it's disputed evidence whether the scuttling charges went off right we're not sort of well i mean the the, the biggest problem is we're trying to work it out is that if the scuttling charges went off and bear in mind i i i, I come from a position of having been lucky enough to actually speak extensively to a bismarck survivor and the 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 accounts of the different people the different survivors from bismarck are very different like some of them don't mention scuttling at all some of them mention feeling something that could have been a scuttling charge it could have been something else others of course you know, swear blind that they received a scuttling order and that scuttling charges were set so there's no single coherent account to be had from the survivors and the way that bismarck settled on the seabed if the scuttling charges were set and if they went off there's not going to be any real surviving evidence of them because of course they if they did go off they would have blown holes in the bottom of the ship yeah and it's come down keel first and basically completely blown out and smashed down the lower three or four decks up basically up to the armor belt area so if you were going to if you were going to even find any evidence of the scuttling charges one it's probably been mangled to 
complete bits by smashing into the seabed. And two, you'd have to, you know, invent a gigantic underwater jack and lift the wreck up and have a look at the underside, <laughs> this mangled mess that is the underside. And like, okay, well, this this was clearly caused by this and not by, you know, a fifty mile an hour impact with with rock and mud or what a, and the subsequent crushing. So, un unfortunately, it's and it's always going to be circumstantial yeah um it's always going to be kind of well if you believe the account of this particular group of survivors then it did happen and if you don't believe them for various reasons then it didn't happen or it may or may not have happened and who knows but um yeah we will we'll, uh, i'm i'm still go doing the research on that I've, i'm basically in the process of going through every single interview i can find with that has been done with Bismarck survivors and charting their accounts on a timeline on an Excel spreadsheet and trying to see which ones vaguely match up and which ones are either clearly the product of a faulty recollection or somebody just making something up. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to piece that together to work out what did or didn't happen or what, let's say, what is most likely or not to have happened one way or the other. I've always, I find it kind of a lot of reasons I find testimonies hmm. like that like one error that i made in one of my previous uh videos i made it in the last enterprise mm. one when enterprise uh launches the final attack in the uh battle of the philippine sea mm. um, with everyone else um i attributed a hit to enterprise that was actually done i believe by yorktown the second pretty sure mm -hmm. um and the big thing was I was using Enterprise's official like battle logs of the Battle of the Philippines. Yes. Series, and I was going through CB6's archives mm. and just checking them. Like the the accounts from pilots especially, because in to get a bit topical, like even with the current Ukraine war, like mm -hmm. another video I'm working on, which is uh the view of the war from Russia's perspective, because I've been on Russian telegram channels the government's mm -hmm. probably watching me right now like they, <laughs> they've they've claimed hi fbi hi fbi the, the russians have claimed 316 aircraft destroyed ukraine's air force at the start of the war was 85 or so so mm. over claiming in air forces and in war in general is huge in every oh yeah and it all comes down to like the the, the chaos of war so if any of those bismarck survivors could have sworn a scuttling charge then how do they tell the difference from like rodney's 16 inch shell just smacking into the side of their ship yeah versus or a, a magazine charge? yeah or a minor magazine detonation because we know at least one of the one i can't remember offhand it was either one of the 105 or 150 mil magazines was on fire um and you know that that's the last anyone knows about it because rather sensibly the people who were in charge of that magazine went screw this turned on all the sprinkler systems and legged it <laughs> bolting the door behind them and they're like well it's either going to explode or not um i don't <laughs> want to be in the vicinity when it when whatever happens and it, you know, even if it doesn't it's going to be flooded so i don't like drowning either <laughs> yeah dr drowning not advisable get out of boat good plan yeah speaking so... of those boats that were there though mm. we should mm. We should introduce everyone's favorite girl, everyone, everyone who has purloined a uh, CD website. Where is she? There she is. Prince Oigan. <laughs> yeah, you didn't even need to think. You knew exactly who it was. Mm -hmm. like, well, my oh. process of elimination from Bisbox Voyage. <laughs> <laughs> my process. Uh, Here she is. It's like, well, the the other German ship. <laughs> the other German ship. Um, yeah. The one that uh, I, I kind of like the, the eyes on that. Yeah, <laughs> because I I I, I was going to say she looks like she's possessed, but then I re and but then I remember what um, I made a, a a joke when I was discussing uh, the like the five minute guide for Prince Organ, which I, I basically called her a luck vampire because <laughs> she's she seems to absor have absorbed the luck that is normally distributed amongst a ship class and just vampirically absorbed it from the rest of the her class <laughs> because you had um you know originally there was supposed to be five hippers two of which were never completed Sadlitz was almost there like the 95 percent complete and then got cut down to be turned into a into a carrier which was also not complete never completed 
Bluka lasts like th- three months in service, if that, before she gets torpedoed by a a, a Norwegian <laughs> torpedo battery that's probably older than anybody on the ship. Um, and Hippa has a couple of early early you know vague successes, and then just has this catastrophic run of hilariously bad luck between getting rammed, getting hit, getting torpedoed being involved in the Battle of the Barren Sea. And then in all the midst of all this, you have Prince Eugen is just like, yes, I went on Operation Reinebung and I survived. I went on the Channel Dash. And I didn't run into a mine. I stayed in Norway and I didn't get tall boyed. <laughs> so I got to the end of World War II and I wasn't killed. It took an atom bomb to, to put me down. It's like, so yeah, this, this kind of sort of va- vaguely uh, otherworldly eye set. I'm like, yeah, okay, she's a vampire. <laughs> yeah, luck vampire. I, I I think um, Prince in the uh, Agile Lane community is well renowned for her character design, giving off mm. a certain vibe. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, like yes. Um, as I said, CD websites. She is the most popular among CD websites for Agile mm-hmm. Lane fan art for obvious reasons. But she. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, don't go there. Really, don't. No. <laughs> it's not a good place. I, with all the with all the searches I do about explosives and propellants and naval technology and everything, I'm on enough watch lists as it is. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, you don't need any more. I mean, no. the thing the thing that really gets me about Prince Eugen's sort of overall sort of lifespan and how she went through the war was she she started on my channel the running gag of the Kriegsmarine, which is whenever mm-hmm. you think you're safe. We made it. We did it. And then the RAF can be heard approaching. Approaching, <laughs> yes. And they are always there. Bomber Harris is waiting, just waiting. And when you least suspect it, he will appear. Like mm. Prince Eugen spent the entire war basically from dry dock to dry dock because she mm. just got bombed every single time, constantly. <laughs> <laughs> there was. The only time she really did anything significant was in the Baltic, uh, supporting retreating Wehrmacht forces, mm. um, along from the Baltics and the Kurland. Like that was basically, yeah, shore based fire. Uh, yeah, shore fire support. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure one of the other hipper classes ended up as the Arlen. I believe it's the top, right? Yeah, that was that was the original Lutzau, um, yeah. before Hitler renamed Deutschland to Lutzau. Um, yeah, because they they they'd agreed to sell her to the Russians, <laughs> and it's just like, yay, we've we've received a mostly complete heavy cruiser. Oh, and the, by the way, the people who sold it to us they're they're invading us now, so I don't think we're getting the rest of the bits. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about it that really sort of confuses me about when I originally did the research for Prince Eugen, I sort of looked at it and I was like, it's it's my worst video by far. As I keep keep. I keep looking at it and I'm going that's an awful lot of tonnage and an awful lot of armor for a heavy cruiser and I was like yeah so why is her performance and her design so bad compared to other cruisers like realistically because because it it feels like there was a lot of wasted space on this well, this is the thing I keep coming back to with most Kriegsmarine designs they're either catastrophically underbuilt because they're trying to adhere to the Versailles Treaty limitations, which is basically the Königsbergs. Yeah. Um, or they are, with the potential exception of the Scharnhorsts, so hilariously inefficient in their construction. Because, like, yeah, like you say, you the the Hippers. By the time you get to Prince Eugen and full load displacement, they're they're thousands of tons over the treaty limit of 10,000 tons for heavy cruisers but they're only really comparable i mean you know you, you compare the compare the overall stats of in terms of number of guns types of guns armor speed etc of a hipper to a county class and the county class the county class design is like 10 15 years older than than the the hippers are, are. And there's not a lot between them. I mean, sure, the Hipper has some, some sort of really sort of warp speed eight-inch guns, but that's not really a, a function of the ship design 
you you could relatively easily if the british had them and and wanted to you could put you could easily put some slightly higher velocity 8 inch on a county without compromising its capabilities i i think it's partly partly it's just inexperience because the germans had this massive long interruption in the 1920s where the only thing of any substantial size they could design was the deutschlands yeah and partly also they were devoted to some rather interesting ideas about how ships should be constructed so they um they're the only major power who enters world war ii without any kind of serious attempt at a dual purpose secondary yeah because it's not not that everybody has succeeded but the british have got the 5.25 and the 4.5 and maybe arguably the 4.7 um, the Americans, of course, have got the 5-inch 38, so they're happy as a clam. Um, the Japanese have theoretically had a dual-purpose 5-inch gun since the late 1920s, even if it's not a particularly good one. And they're just in the process of introducing the 100mm, which you find on the Akazuki, which is actually an absolutely superb dual-purpose weapon. It's just they only build, like, four dozen of them over the course of the entire war it's um, a theme with the japanese navy <laughs> yeah uh, the french have given it their best shot um the the, the triple and quad uh, turrets that you see on the Rich uh, the secondaries that you see on richelieu and dunkirk etc they were all supposed to be dual purpose okay it didn't quite work out but they'd given it a decent try um, and the Italians, I mean, okay, the 90 mil is a little bit anemic for anti-surface action, but they put a fair ton of them on the Littorios. Um, and, and okay, yeah, they put some triple sixes on there as well because they realize in 90 mil is a little anemic. But, you know, again, they've given it a decent shot. The Germans are just like, we're, we're, we're going with separate anti-air and anti-surface batteries. And the, the, the closest you get to a dual purpose weapon is some of the later 127 millimeter developments during the war itself and that 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 increases the problem because you look at you know, again you look at a county or a new orleans etc they've got dual purpose secondary batteries hippo has to have separate uh, anti surface and anti air batteries so that's going to increase the weight and they also have this devotion to the turtle back armor scheme uh, much beloved of some and not really rated by too many others <laughs> it's all or nothing baby all or nothing yeah. I mean the, the, the turtle back and semi distributed armour scheme yes okay it makes it in theory slightly harder to put a German ship to the bottom of the ocean in the immediate term but it also makes it far easier to render them combat ineffective in the first place so you then have the time to make sure they go down um, and of course you have the other issue which is present on bismarck i'm not 100 percent sure if it's present on the hippers but um the turtle back certainly on bismarck renders the citadel space so small that it actually doesn't matter it, even if the citadel space is full on wearaboo invincible <laughs> it doesn't have enough reserve buoyancy to keep the ship afloat you just blow holes in everything else and it'll sink anyway <laughs> <laughs> yes um, we, we have the citadels at 70 percent of the ship everything yeah. will be fine the front and yeah. the back have no armor whatsoever this will not be a problem <laughs> so yeah there, there's a litany of complaints that you can level at, at 1930s german ships and which I, I to a certain extent i find slightly bizarre because you have the Scharnhorst. it's like they actually pulled off a pretty decent ship with the Scharnhorst, especially if they if they'd um either rebuilt them or built them in as originally with 15 inch guns, guns you would have had yeah. a yeah you would have had a slight at that point you would have had a slightly under treaty limit displacement battleship which okay is missing compared to everybody else a couple of main battery guns but in exchange has an has a slight has a higher speed than most which is a fair trade-off and you've got a little bit of additional let's say you've got a little bit of additional displacement left so you know you could in theory make a slightly stretched 15 inch shan horse with eight eight 15 inch guns and that would actually be a relatively decent efficient design and then they just who I don't know. Did they send? Did they send the guy who came up with the Chandos to a concentration camp or any or something like that? Because the, <laughs> the, 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 everyone else, everything after that is just like, no, we're just going to pile the pounds on. I mean, it's it's one of those bizarre things. Like I always find that the, the Germans have this really awful habit. Like I mean, 
you can either you can either when they do want to design they'll either build something that's they they like hacking stuff on that mm. doesn't need to be there in every single yes. one of their engineering projects in the bf109 the focal wolf like kurt tank did a massive massively good job with the focal wolf 190 keeping the design in check mm. um but with the meshesmith especially meshesmith as well as tank designers as well like you'll have one design and then there'll be like 15 to 16 production variations inside the first run like if you have to add this now now if we need mm. we need extra electrics for this we need to give hydraulics <laughs> to this we need to build the bigger cannon like it, and so half the Wehrmacht's tanks are inoperable because not like one spare batch of spare parts is only mm. applicable to this type of tank. And yeah. it's endemic throughout the entire German war economy. And I can only well, assume you... that the Kriegsmarine suffered the same fate to an extent. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it, again, looking at the Hippers, none of the Hippers are identical. No. Like Prince Eugen is heavier, longer by you know an appreciable margin than hipper is and blue is somewhere in the middle and sadlitz and lutzow were going to be larger still <laughs> uh, so it's uh, just yeah just for it's almost french there we yeah. go just for just for comparison because we're on that topic yeah. we have ourselves an admiral hipper <laughs> yeah it, it is sort of it, interesting. It looks like she's looking worriedly at um it, yeah you could just imagine prince eugen's off to one side just <laughs> looking very carefully for bite points on hipper's neck <laughs> it was just like uh -oh. um please back off oh, we've, slightly creepy one we've got him boys he's already writing he? azure lane fan fiction in his head it's only a matter of time <laughs> it's only a matter of time but if we again well very well modeled turrets yeah they are and what i find interesting is you have like prince eugen's sort of design and then you have hipper who's got the red paint on her turrets mm. uh but it's time to meet Hipper's arch nemesis. Glue. <laughs> hey, there we go. <laughs> oh dear. HMS Glowworm. Mm. The, Slightly oh, less jail baity than Z twenty fifth or Oh, you you would think so. You would think so. But no. No, 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 no. She she has a bit of a younger design to her. It's just that she's not as um shall we say evocative, shall we call it? Yes. But, one thing I will say about Glowworm that's really funny is we were talking about it earlier, how like characteristics from ships are represented mm. in the anime and the game. All of Glowworm's special abilities in the game and her appearances in the mm -hmm. anime specialize in ramming. She rams <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've even got the bow there with the distinctive little box gun, <laughs> as I like to call it. <laughs> It's rather great. I do like the fact that because she's a melee a melee character, her anchor mm. is actually like a, a combat staff and she Pole has weapon, a little, yeah. <laughs> she's got a searchlight <laughs> hanging on the back. Oh, uh, her captain is one of what, only like three people I think who got nominated by the enemy for the Victoria Cross. For VC. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> The captain wrote through the captain wrote to the red cross like i don't know who that guy was but he needs a medal yeah, yeah. Do you, like do have you done a, a deeper dive i don't know if you've done a deeper dive on the escapades between glowworm and um i think i i covered it in um a video i did on the norway campaign so it, it got like i think about five ten minute segment um but at, at some point uh, the thing the thing is it's one of those actions that's actually relatively speaking short for a naval battle. So I can't really do a, a Wednesday video like I do for some other naval battles where I go over and it's like, this is, this is the run up. This is the battle. This is the aftermath because the whole thing would be over in 15 minutes. Um, but on the other hand, there are a reasonable number of survivors accounts from people on Glowworm and people who were on HIPAA as well, letters and so forth. Um, so perhaps perhaps I could do a video on that encounter, but, you know, where a decent chunk of it is just me reading how the people who were actually there experienced it all. It's really interesting because... That... I've always wanted to do a series on my channel, which is when destroyers mm. fought ba when destroyers fought battleships. And yes, I know mm. if it's a heavy cruiser, but mm. like you think about you know Johnston charging Yamato, like yeah, you think of Glowworm, you think of Laffy mm. absolutely bodying here, like yeah. 
You've got Piron some... just sitting in front of Bismarck, <laughs> signaling at her. <laughs> come at me, bro. <laughs> come at me, bro. I, I... Yeah, I bet you if if they'd known about that saying at the time, they probably would have included it. <laughs> Um, I think I think the translation these days is Russian warship fuck off. Um, mm, <laughs> in yeah. recent times, but it's the same. It's the same sort of message. Like these small, ill-equipped <laughs> destroyers mm. just charging battleships. Um, it ha it happens way more often than you'd expect it to, and it almost always seems to be by complete accident. Well, a lot of the, to be honest, a lot of the time in certainly in the in the Royal Navy, um, and I think to a certain extent in the U.S. Navy as well. And I, I get in, in some other navies, I don't get so much of a sense of it. But you know, that's not to say they didn't. But I just haven't read enough about those captains as a large group to come up with the con safely with the conclusion. But certainly in the British and U.S. navies when they seem to have been evaluating officers for their command tracks where they come across a particularly violently aggressive officer they're like right he's perfectly suited for destroyers <laughs> um so you might have someone who actually you know, takes a certain degree of care and attention and they're like right we'll put him in a cruiser or a battleship because you know that's actually expensive and we don't want it broken and then you basically get Captain Leroy Jenkins, Esquire, and it's like, right, yes, yeah, stick him in a destroyer and point him at the enemy. Something <laughs> fun was going to happen. There's, there's an entire anime series about that called High School Fleet. It's the same mm -hmm. concept. The The hero ship is the Harakaze, which I think is a um, same uh, same class of destroyer as the UK. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what the class is. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, but like they they assembled this this crew for this little destroyer out of the misfit and their yeah. and their torpedo officer like her her default answer to every situation is well if all else fails we'll get the biggest torpedo we can and just fire it at whatever <laughs> we find like is that they they go toe to toe with the musashi like they literally mm. in the anime they go toe to toe with the musashi and fire um torpedoes at it and then there's a movie where they take on like the naval equivalent of a Blackstone Fortress. Um, mm -hmm. And again, the the whole plan is get in there, fight our way past the perimeter, which includes, I think, um, a uh, littoral combat ship, a modern littoral combat mm -hmm. ship in this World War II destroyer. And then we'll put... To be fair, a, that's probably not too difficult. <laughs> that's probably not too difficult, you're right. And then we've equipped, like, the largest torpedo Japan ever made, and we'll just mm. yeet it. <laughs> yeah. into the core of this this fortress and we'll be fine um but yeah destroyer captains are like they're metal the metal is the metal as hell like they yeah they do sh I, I also quick aside for being metal as hell have you noticed that both of us have got some good nautical got some yes. nautical some nautical beards going on mm -hmm. you're gonna you're trying to grow that bad boy out you're gonna try and get that um, this is probably about as short as it gets. I, uh, I trimmed it recently. It, it kind of it it comes and goes. I don't tend to grow it. It gets about maybe twice as 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 long and as thick as this, and then I trim it back again, mostly because it's just for convenience' sake. Um, I have had it longer in the past, but to... uh, combined combined with my mixed heritage, if I have a particularly long beard, I suddenly start getting pulled out of lines and stopped at airports and. <laughs> things like that which just gets irritating after a while uh don't, don't worry my dad's military so we get stopped anyway they're like oh mm. we're doing a random check for explosive residue i'm like oh random is it like mm. you stopped the middle eastern gentleman over there and you've stopped the ex-military guys oh it's random yes 100 random <laughs> like there's no way <laughs> but... i mean i once nearly got shot by icelandic airport security because they thought i had a bomb <laughs> <laughs> but that's pretty that's pretty hardcore coming from the icelanders they don't have an army <laughs> no no it, the, the problem was that this this was way back this was years ago this was back in the day when dslr cameras were a new thing oh okay um and so me being me i was gone to iceland i taken my brand new all singing all dancing dslr which i still have somewhere around here um and i'd stuck it in a camp you know the old classic camera bags um and with its charger and with my phone and in its charger and everything 
and um in those side pockets that all those camera bags used to have where you'd you stick like your flash unit and your 35 mil film rolls if you were still using a film camera i just stuck a couple of big naval history books i think it was um uh i think it was dk massey's two books about the run-up to and world war one um and i put those in the side compartments and then of course they put it through the x-ray scanner and what do they see on the x-ray a couple of batteries a ton of random electronics which was not what they were expecting to see in a camera bag because dslr's brand new and two massive indeterminate gray rectangular blocks that appeared to be in some way adjacent to the electronics <laughs> <laughs> and i was just like oh. uh when they showed me the x-ray afterwards i was like yeah okay i can see where you're coming from on that <laughs> yeah that, that would have it's a bit of that's man getting pulled aside in iceland by iceland of mm. people that's pretty intense yeah they don't get especially mad. when you have no idea what they're saying yeah what is this it's like, I, I don't speak icelandic please help <laughs> What have we got? Speaking, if we're going, if we're going Nordic, if we're going Nordic campaigns, where have we got a? We're doing, we're talking about it. There we go. Why not? There we, yeah, fair. The there queen we, of the north. The lonely queen of the north, which is what she's called in the game, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. There she is. What do you think? Yeah, again, I, I, this is kind of like, kind of like Hood. I quite, uh, I quite like this as a. Uh, as an outfit and uh design again they've got the they've got the turrets you've got the little shark motif going on but a little less less aggressive um yeah that's quite stylish i like the fact that she's got the sort of uh, her difference between bismarck's design mm. like she's got the uh extra radar gear and stuff on mm. her back section because she's got he went through an AA refit, whereas Bismarck didn't get to. No, yeah, and and as I say, you've got like they've even like toned down the 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 shark mouths are closed, which is kind of yeah similar. Like Bismarck, what's Bismarck known for? Sailing out, sinking hood, getting sunk. Turpit's kind of like yeah, you know, sit in a fjord, <laughs> chill out <laughs> for a bit, oh. a little bit more, a little bit more calm and collected. Everyone was asking me to do a video mm. on Turpit, so I did one. It was almost two hours long. And I remember sitting there having... I had the worst writer's block I've had for any YouTube video I've done. Because I'm like, how the hell am I going to write this? Because you can't have an adventure with Turpits, because it's go north, park in a fjord, get bombed, sink. <laughs> yeah. She goes out like, once. <laughs> Shell Spitzbergen... <laughs> Then get X crafted, then get FAA, then get RAF'd. <laughs> um, yeah. RAF is um, an understatement. Like, mm. well, you them. got the bit of, uh, very early on where she pretended to be a, a hotel. That's quite funny. <laughs> well, she is a hotel, really. Yeah. Might as well have been. <laughs> now, have you, have you seen have you seen the photos where she's all painted up, looking like she's made of masonry and brickwork with windows <laughs> and everything? Yeah, it's it's uh, kind of bizarre. The, 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 see, the one weird thing about that is, is like I'm looking at it and going, from the perspective of this photo, which is taken at the quayside, yes, it is actually genuinely a little bit difficult to work out where the ship is with the background of all the masonry. However, I would like to point out to whoever came up with that wonderful paint scheme that probably took a, like a month to put on. Aerial recon doesn't work from like <laughs> six foot above the quayside. So unless you painted the, the the top to look like the harbor or something, they're going to be like, "There's a ship. It's still a ship. Maybe from a very slight angle, it's got a slightly weird camo on the side. It's still going to be a ship." Maybe it was just it was sort of an anti torpedo measure. Like, oh, dice say chap, yeah. we can't tell tell where the shore starts and the boat. Possibly, yeah. Although at that point, you have to ask, you know, if if Wilhelm's Harvard is being bombed by the R, is being having torpedo bombers come up the <laughs> harbor, with, something's gone horribly wrong with the Luftwaffe. Although then again, given, given the uh, relationship between Radar and Dönitz and Göring, it's not necessarily surprising that they might have gone. You know what? We don't trust the Luftwaffe to protect us in our own harbor. The the fact that the Luftwaffe, like the fact. That Germany never had a fleet air arm equivalent. Mm. Blows. 
It was entirely Goering's ego. Ah, oh, the power yeah. troopers they will be mine, and the Fleck batteries will be mine, hmm. and also the the, the... I mean, even <laughs> even the little Arado one ninety sixes that they had as scout aircraft were actually theoretically Luftwaffe. Yeah, they were just lent to the navy yeah. on their boat. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes, sometimes it does amaze me because I, you look through the history of World War Two, and it's like, was the Kriegsmarine High Command the only element of German Armed Forces High Command that wasn't high off of its face on meth? <laughs> I, because I don't know, because you see, again, the Marine definitely was high as a kite on all sorts of things. Uh, morphine mainly. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's it just I, I don't know did they make Goring afterwards if I wouldn't have wanted to do so It'd be a bit of a toxic hazard yeah was... um but uh yeah and like half the well I don't know necessarily about the German army, army generals but certainly a bunch of the uh you know Panzer Schokolade is a meme for a reason <laughs> I, I don't know man all I know is that like uh, the old debate that gets raged around in uh, axis mm. axis history forums if you want to delve down that dark and de terrible oh dear lord no <laughs> don't go in there the variable is strong mm. um but the the big debate is of course the one that we all talk about which is plan z or um plan z is that the way or mm. is it um Dernitz's u-boat bonanza all sales must go They're all products mm. like because i feel like you can build 10 u-boats for one bismarck if not more mm. and that might have been a better yeah. investment <laughs> Well, I mean, neither of them is going to win you the war, but if you're going to get closer to, then probably Dönitz is the way to go. Because, you know, Germany had already tried out building the Royal Navy when it came to surface warships. Uh, it didn't end very well. They got clapped. And, yeah, and the industry disparity between World War II German naval infrastructure and World War II British naval infrastructure was considerably wider than it had been in the run-up to world war one so i mean that's what that's why i did i did the plan z video and then a few years later i did the what would britain have done in response to plan z and it's just like that's I mean, when you get the idea it's the, it was never going to work even if you magicked all the resources and all the money to pay for plan z the surface element of plan z was never going to seriously work because i mean it, it comes down to the very simple fact putting economy and infrastructure parts aside a navy is a luxury for germany it's a necessity for britain one side's always going to commit a lot more to to it than the other but the the u-boats as you say they're they're small they're cheap relatively speaking um you can build them pretty quickly so yeah if if you're going to do maximum damage then you really want to be hitting the uh the u-boat production spam U-boat production spam's the way to go, you reckon? I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it might not. It's it's not going to win you. I say it's not going to win you the war between you know sonar and depth charges and a hedgehog and the genius the genius girls in Watu in Liverpool. It, it, they're, they're gonna, you're going to get overcome eventually because it turns out you know you pick a fight with the two biggest industrial powers on the planet they can outbuild you in anti-sub escorts <laughs> quite happily but but you could make things a lot dicier and a lot lot more of a closer run than they were historically i think the big one for me is the like the lack of a fleet air arm of serious capacity was mm. like those condors were able to get pretty far out into the north Atlantic and them spotting for a fleet of a hundred U-boats would have been a rather nasty proposition, at least. Yeah, well, I mean, again, this is another artifact of of you know the supposed efficient German war machine, which is anything but, because you've got you've got Condors, you've got Ju eighty nines, you've got Ju two two eighty eights, you've got about fifteen different variants of Heinkel, like you. The, and they're all produced in little batches. I mean, you've got the Blomont Voss, you know, the BV flying boats, the the Viking, and then the six engine monster, and her hand, and a bunch of others. And you look around, and it's like, okay, again, you know, the British relatively quick. They've got a bunch of pre-war stuff, but they relatively quickly standardise on the Sunderland and imported Catalinas for their flying boats, um, and you know, and bombers okay they have the sterling because it's an emergency thing and, and then they settle down on the halifax and the lancaster uh, yeah. for, for long-range bombing 
and then you look at the Germans and you're just like there, there's like three times as many of any t particular aircraft type for the Germans as there is for the British. You were talking earlier about like the billion and one variants of the BF 109. Um, <laughs> but it's like you, you think about how, how many twin engine fighters and fighter conversions were they throwing into the air? They had fighter conversions of Dornier 17s, 217s, Junkers 88s, Heinkel 219s, BF 110s, BF 210s, <laughs> BF 410s. It's like, pick something and stick with it, damn yeah, it. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> it's the, like the, our little fleet of two dozen FW 200s and the, or whatever. Like, there was a mess. The, the Reichsministeriat uh, for aircraft production put out like a memorandum mm. in like 1940. Yeah, I think it was. Mm. Um,. I think it might have been. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head when Speer took over, but I do remember there was this big thing between Milch and Speer. They were like, okay, we're going to go to this factory. We're going to go see. Uh, James Holland wrote about this in his uh, War mm. of the Western Union. Highly recommend for anyone watching. If you haven't read, please. But the big one was like, he goes to Messerschmitt and he's like, hey, um, so we need to increase 109 production to like a thousand a month or something stupid like we need planes like um we need every plane you can get us because the americans have started heavy bombers we need to we need mm. to get something out there to stop this like fuck wolf's all right he's doing okay he's starting to build his 190s we need 109s and we need you to get your next generation of stuff on the way so we want 109s and we want 262s later down the track if you can right pretty straightforward goes in to see meshes me it's like Yo, my dude, check it out. I've got this 210 thing here. And I've got an even mm -hmm. better version of 410. Also, we've got this massive transport plane. It's really great. we got this. we got that. Like, why are, you div why are you building, like, seven or eight different experimental products in all little batches? Mm. And then, like, oh, maybe 200 109s here. Like, Spear and Milch have a fit. And, like, it's... <laughs> It, like, did the U-boats ever have the same problem? Because the U-boats really the only serial production thing that the Kriegsmarine did. 100%. In on mass, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, there's there's like five different variants on the Type Nine, um, but they're they're kind of understandable to a certain extent because, yeah, the, the base, basically the variants of the Type Nine are we need more range <laughs> <laughs> um, constantly. <laughs> But, um, and the, the Type 7, to a certain extent, is the same. They're, they're just kind of looking at it. Because the thing is, the Type 7 is, it, you know, much, much as people some say, oh, Bismarck's a warmed over World War One design. It's not. It's got elements. It's got strong elements of World War One design principles in it that get tr brought forward. Um, but it's not It's not like Bayern, but, with, but slightly faster. <laughs> but the, so the original Type 7... If you compare that with some of the late war, I think it's UB2s or UC2s um, of the late war Imperial German Navy, and you put the two together, you're like, they're practically the same. It, the, the Type 7 is very, very much a warmed over World War I design. Uh, the Type 9 is a little bit more advanced, but it's still very heavily drawing on older, older lessons. And so you have what, in theory, you'd think of as your closer close to mid-range sub and your long range sub and but realistically in their original forms the type 7 is more of a out to western approaches bay of biscay area at most sub and the type 9 is like well we can get into the mid atlantic yeah and then they then then they then they start making variants so you the type 7c is the classic one and they stop you know, putting more and more fuel in them so they can go further. They start basing it out of Western France, which helps a bit as well. And then you get, you know, the Type Seven, which can now just about get off to get off to the east coast of the US. The Type Nine can stick around for a fair bit longer. Um, so you can understand to a certain degree the the build variants on on those, but at least they're still vaguely recognizable as each other. Yeah, because I think the, the the other big problem, if I'm not mistaken, with the German aircraft industry was the amount of engine variation as well. Yeah, it got pretty bad. Like the early model 605s had a lot of teething mm. issues, mainly because of the um they they had a massive fear of bottlenecking in certain industries, like ball bearings being mm. the biggest, which is why mm. the Allies went after the ball bearing factories early on, much to their cost. Um it's what ended up killing Hans Joachim Marseille actually, and 
mm -hmm. what almost killed Eric Hartman as well. Um, the early model 605s and the early G models used slide bearings instead of ball bearings to try mm -hmm. and limit the production of ball bearings for engines. Yeah. And the thing about slide bearings is to have slide bearings effectively run in an engine, you need two things. You need high quality alloys and you need lubricants. And you don't have much of either. <laughs> and your Germany, which started this whole war because you've got a shortage of oil and a shortage of um, special metals. Right? Mm. They have to import all their chromium and all their um, tungsten from yeah. Sweden and Turkey. So, and the Soviet Union before 1941. So, mm. like, it's it's one of those things where the Germans have constantly got all these issues. They have to keep redesigning everything and then they just keep tacking bits on, tacking bits on. I got a new book recently. Hold on. This. Uh, All right. The <laughs> Panzer Mouse. I don't know if it's mm. probably reversed on my screen yeah, yeah. here. No, it's I can read it. Yeah. Yep. The Mouse. Uh, mm. And uh, Chunky Boy, too. It's $100 worth of book, mm. this thing. Um, but that is. Like, reading this is just... The German war industry throughout was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, it, it shows, I mean, if you, like you said with the aircraft, it's, you think about British aircraft production, and, okay, when you start the war, you've got things like the Kestrel uh, and the Peregrine engine trying to fit into the whirlwind and so forth. But pretty quickly, by kind of 41-ish, the question, the main question in in the british aircraft industry is can it fit a merlin or will it take a saber yeah basically um and that's it uh, with a few outliers and then like we well, can mass produce everything and the, the in the america fit for america it's like again very quickly it's a case of can we fit a packard merlin in it and if not can we fit a twin wasp in it yeah <laughs> and that's the, that's your binary solution one radial one one inline and then you look at the germans it's like wow that's a lot of engines 601 uh umos of various types you've got the jet mm -hmm. engines which again we eventually had to deal with but mm -hmm. you've got like um also the i mean the biggest one i think the biggest success story for the german luftwaffe was of course the focke wolf really. mm. yeah going, going into my area purely because that tank came up with this great design and was like okay this will work after a few teething troubles with cooling because he tried to have an aerodynamic fairing over the massive BMW yeah. radial. Um, eventually he got it going and he was like, okay, cool. It's working now. Can I get it to run uh, with the BMW radial? It will work fine, yes. And he did a whole series from the A1 all the way to the A8 and F8 to in the BMW radials of increasing power. And BMW, mm. to their credit, kept that same engine design and just sort of improved it, improved it, improved it, improved it, mm. improved it. And eventually they ran it out. Then when the 190 was starting to get seriously outperformed by the P-51 and the Spit LF-9 and, of mm. course, the uh, Walker Typhoon and Tempest, or they're mainly the Tempest, they realized that they needed to get more smash out of the 190, so they switched to the Yumo engine, the Yumo inline mm. for the Junkers 88. So they strapped the Junkers 88 engine. But you're right, the German engine variety was quite impressive. It, it was mainly the transition between the 605 a to the um models of 605 where they finally worked out the kinks but working mm. the one engine which i have covered in a collaboration coming up with a friend of mine who does the ukraine slideshows perrin mm -hmm. uh covers an aircraft called the heinkel 177 and they realized <laughs> they realized they couldn't get the engine they couldn't fit four engines because if you foot four engines it can't mm. be a dive bomber and if you can't mm. be a dive bomber what use is it Luftwaffe? Everything needs to be yes. a dive bomber. So we have to fit. So what do we do? We smish two 605s on top of each other onto one propeller and then go, yeah, that'll be fine. It doesn't need to be four engine. Problem. You still have the same exhaust system and the same fuel system as the original 605. And it just shared between the two engines. And you're doing it at double the revs. So maybe all the heat from those engines is going to go through those. And so, yeah. like, 16, 16 Heinkel 177s deployed to Stalingrad in 1943, trying to relieve the uh, pocket. Mm. Um, of 16, 8 crashed due to engine fires. 
Um, yeah, I always thought it was very funny that it was called the Grife because I was just like, in English, it's you switch grief. two letters around and it's grief. It's like, yeah, grief. that pretty much that describes it. <laughs> Although, speaking of weird, weird designs and mm -hmm. a little bit of conspiracy theories, see if you can recognize this one here. You'll probably see it because I've got my thing up. Mm -hmm. uh, there she is. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, Philadelphia experiment. Again, we're going to prison, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, the design here is you recognize it instantly just because of all the yes. weird electronics and shenanigans going around. Yeah. So, have you done a video? I've done a video on the Philadelphia experiment. I don't know if you have. No, I haven't yet, no. Um, no, I mean, yeah, there, there's such a conspiracy around it. I mean, th th the thing is, right, if you want to play, if you want to play it completely straight and, you know, because the whole destroyer brought in to become invisible and mysterious gantry equipment that goes around it and ethereal weird lighting effects and so on and so forth. If you want to play it absolutely straight, rational explanation, it's like, well, actually, that's there, there's a very easy explanation for that. It's gone through a degaussing array. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I don't know if you've ever seen a degaussing array. They still use them. Yeah. Um, there's, 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 they're not common, but they are around in various ports, military ports. And it is, it's a massive gantry array that you feed a ship through, usually a sub these days. Um, and, you know, you pump a bunch of electricity through it to, to degauss the ship and counter its magnetic field. And then you can construct things of, yeah, okay, at the time of the supposed Philadelphia experiment, the Americans are just getting stuck in. They they need this. They need to be able to counter the German magnetic mines, and you know, for someone who's never seen a degaussing array before, seeing a destroyer being brought in to become quote unquote invisible because it is becoming invisible to magnetic sensors, um, and then seeing it fed into this weird gantry where they like drape cables over it and then they power it up and you know if there's any kind of moisture in the air or a very slightly mistuned um, array, you're going to get all sorts of weird electrical arcing effects and fantastic glowing and everything. Which again, you know, for some for a, a navy that's new to the idea of using it, um, would make sense. Followed probably by a short circuit that plunges half the dock into darkness, <laughs> um, which, during which time someone's probably towing the ship out to work out what the heck happened to our to our degaussing array, and then when all the powers restored, it's like all oh, the ship has vanished from the, <laughs> from the mysterious countries. It's like yes, because they're they're trying how to figure out how not to have that happen again, um, and it's like all of a sudden it all becomes very mundane, and um, yeah. But, but on the other hand, given some of the absolute wackiness that was going on in World War II, you know, the idea that someone was trying to invent a Romulan cloaking device four centuries too early, I wouldn't necessarily put it past them. Um, no, I, I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't. I mean, I've... I mean, they went ahead with the Manhattan Project when the you know, the best scientists around thought there was like a 30% chance they might accidentally set fire to the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> so, you know, wacky safety considerations were not necessarily high up on their list of priorities. They did, just a very small part of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd love, I'd love to see like the 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 risk assessment for that. It's like, there's a thirty percent chance we might like, burn the atmosphere off the planet with our new bomb and kill everything known to mankind. Yeah, let's go with that one. Yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, we'll. It's kind of like the uh, the the big panic around the Large Hadron Collider back in the day. It's sort of the same sort of thing. Like, we we might end the. Mm. I, I did see. I think it was on mock. I think it was on mock the week or something. They were the British comedy show. They had a joke about they like they joked about it for several episodes, and then somebody just said, "Well, you know what? I don't actually care if a large hadron collider creates a black hole that destroys the planet because France is closer to Switzerland, so the French will go first. <laughs> Speaking of the French, great oh, no. segue, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time for the most uh, conflicted I've felt about a ship girl right here. Oh boy. You know, that's nowhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. No? 
No. No, I was thinking given given the given the stereotypical reputation of the French. Yeah. Um I was like I was thinking, oh no, this is gonna be bad, but at least from this angle it's not awful. Jean... I've seen people wear I've seen people wearing less in London. Yeah. Put it that way. Yeah. Jean Bart is Jean Bart is um well she's a favourite of mine. I wish she wasn't because she's <laughs> French. But for obvious reasons, as you can see, mm. like she's a very popular design. Uh, she has the best figure for Azure Lane in mm -hmm. terms of like models that you can get. But like, I find it kind of interesting. I probably should have used Richelieu, um, mm -hmm. for like to sort of advertise the sort of design itself. But the sort of the guns are what got me here. Like the, the quads, the, yeah, the quads. Um, it's a very iconic part of Jean Bart's sort of character design as a whole. I'm not so sure. I, I'm not too well versed on French battle. I'm not so because I know that the Royal Navy had a lot of problems with its quad barrel. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the French had the same problem. So the French actually they didn't have m many problems with the turrets themselves because they they actually did a ton of work on quad turrets in World War One, right. um, which was actually related to it was actually related to the fact that the they couldn't actually persuade anyone to upgrade their naval infrastructure very much. So when they were left with, you know, everyone building Queen Elizabeth's and Nevada's and Bayern's, etc., um, the French were left in this unenviable position of not actually being able to necessarily compete with people in terms of size of ship or size of gun. So they just decided, well, the solution is clearly more gun, but how do we get more gun onto a ship that's not much bigger than a Britannia? Okay, we'll invent the quad turret. Um, so you get the Normandy design, which it has three quad turrets with the 13 point whatever that they stick on Britannia. Um, so it has 12 guns on broadside. And then you get the Lyons, which is based, crudely speaking, is someone going, well, what if we cut a section out of a Normandy, put a plug in that's got another quad turret on? <laughs> so it has four quad turrets, which the, if, they, if built would have made it the most heavily gunned in terms of barrel number battleship ever constructed, because they have 16 guns. Um, that they don't get built. The Leons don't get built at all. The Normandies mostly get broken up after the war because France is broke and can't afford to complete them, and they're obsolete pretty much by that point. One gets turned into an aircraft carrier, which is Bern, uh, which is probably a fate worse than death for the poor old thing. <laughs> um, uh, but it means that when they go into the 1930s, they have this body of work that they've done about quad turrets. They then put quad turrets on Dunkirk and Strasbourg with 13-inch guns. And so when they come to building the Richelieu's, they're actually technically got three generations worth of quad turret design under their belt. Which means that the, the I sometimes like to joke that the Richelieu's, they're more like two twin turrets in very close formation because they put a fairly thick bulkhead down the middle. Because yeah. they realise with, with only two got, turrets, if, if we lose... sort of like... Split, like, yeah. Like that, yeah. Yeah. Because they realise, you know, if, if we've only got two turrets, if one of them gets hit and taken out, we've lost half our main battery. So their solution is, you know, split it down the middle. At that way, if one side gets hit, maybe the other side will keep going. Which is a bit optimistic, because to be honest, if something's hitting you hard enough to penetrate the frontal armour on one of your main battery turrets, chances are it's probably also going to, you know, deform the turret, unseat it from its... Re from its um, it's rotator a, bearings it's, it's a very it's, it's gonna wreck the thing yeah it's a very french design philosophy i must have there, there's a small chance that it might actually that like one half the turret might go down and the other half stay operational so they run with that um they do have some major problems though but as i said it's it's almost entirely not with the gun the, the guns the guns and the turret itself generally work fairly well um one of the big problems they have though is the shells <laughs> um and uh yeah shells misfiring shells blowing off parts of barrels shells detonating in midair shells cartwheeling off into directions which are entirely different from where you want them to do that is a major major problem and one of the biggest causes not the only but one of the biggest causes is um they decided to have the capability even if they didn't necessarily always exercise it um they wanted to have the capability to fit poison gas canisters into the shells. 
Oh. <laughs> which, so they, they, they had this kind of screw-in attachment at the base, which was also where you could put a dye bag to, you know, give the shell plume a colour so you could work out whose shells were whose. But of course, you know, you don't normally go chucking around explosive shells laced with you know, strychnine or chlorine or whatever. Um, so they were firing them without these canisters put in place. But of course, that meant there was a hollow in the base of the shell where all the pressure from the uh, from the um, propellant being discharged built up and put stress on the shell in a way that the designers had not intended there to be stress because they'd intended for there to be something there. And so the shell started coming apart and detonating and got their own volition. And it was all a bit of a mess, which is one of the reasons why when you see the picture of Richelieu coming into New York, um, it has a number of guns missing or <laughs> in bits because of you know issues with the shells. But once they actually... Re when they refit Richelieu in New York, they don't really change all that much about her turrets or her guns, but they do get a special batch production run done of um, shells for her uh, made in America, which obviously don't have any of this uh, poison gas nonsense stuck in the base. And they work perfectly fine. And she's, she's a perfectly serviceable battleship afterwards. <laughs> Need a... Uh, like, the, the French... I must admit... Again, bleeding over into aircraft design, the mm. French always have this really sort of diagonal approach to solving problems in engineering. Every time, mm. like the 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 Potez six three three, I um like they wanted to build a bomber version of a two seat fighter. Kind of imagine mm -hmm. converting an ME an ME one ten into a bomber, and right? and you replace the observer slot with a bomb bay. But they realize that the front of the aircraft is full of cannons and machine guns. So they can't put a bomb site for the bomb bay. Now you would think you would fit like vertical racks with a hindquarter, and you would sort of do a short, mm -hmm. shallow dive thing. No, 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 no. We we will solve this problem. What we will do is we will make the rear gunners the bombardier, and we will build a periscope, and it will go all the way down the length of the <laughs> aircraft to the front. <laughs> and so when they try, so when they're on the bomb run, the the rear gunner has to turn around and look look down the periscope, and it's just like. And because the periscope's running, the entire aircraft is just vibrating all over the place. Yeah. Can we hit anything? No. And the bomb bay, they eventually rigged this fighter because they didn't, like, fit external mm. ordnance or everything. They're like, oh, yes, must be a bomb bay. Um, yeah, they could only carry, like, four bombs. Um, yeah. Making the entire thing... Pointless. Yeah, so, like, French engineering is a... Is a like, it, they come at it from, like, a way different... Like... Yeah. Laser Pig did a the great French... video about French tanks for the same reason. It's, it's yes, yeah, oh yeah, I've watched that. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, to be honest, like the, their French warships are probably the one of the few areas where their technology, their, their I'd say their interwar warships, their like nineteen thirties warships, are probably a good return to form for them because the French, in in naval construction terms, back in the age of sail, they were making some of the best looking, theoretically best performing warships around. Uh, they did have a distressing habit of working themselves too, far too loose and falling apart after three months at sea. But hey, the French Navy was spending most of its time sat around in ports. So it didn't matter too much. Um, and then they they keep on producing, you know, fairly decent advanced designs. They come up with the world's first steam propelled uh, age of sail ship of the line with Napoleon. They technically get their foot in the door as the first ironclad with Gloire, even if it's not a particularly brilliant one. And then at some point, in the 18 sorry, in the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War, they just seem to completely and utterly lose it when it comes to being able to design both aesthetically pleasing and actually functional warships. Yeah. And by the time they pick up their pre-dreadnought designs, are just no. <laughs> I mean, you 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 have a theoretic what's supposed to be a class of 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 ships. I think it's four or five ships. And they issue them. They issue the specs out to the shipyard, but they just issue the specs. You know, it must be able to go this fast. Must carry this many guns. Must have this much armor. And they leave it entirely up to multiple different shipyards to interpret those guidelines. So you end up with a bunch of ships which couldn't look more diverse if you tried, <laughs> with completely different capabilities and design styles. Um, and yeah eventually they managed to wrangle everyone into line with something approximating a coherent class design 
and then turn out to be like two year, three years behind everybody else because they're they're building Danton class pre dreadnoughts at a time when everyone else is bringing out thirteen point five and fourteen inch gun super dreadnoughts. The core bays are the possibly the single single worst dreadnought first generation dreadnought ever built with the arguable exception of the Espanias, which are built on uh, like four pesos and something we found down the back of a sofa. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, and then you're just looking, it's like, what happened to you, France? You used to be cool. You now you're building cool. the, yeah, now you're building these horrific things. And then you get into the interval period. They build the Duquesne class heavy cruisers where it turns out, cause they don't have a decent grade of, high tensile structural steel um they, they they have to overbuild the duquesne so much they basically can't afford armor so you have a heavy cruiser that could be taken down by a particularly aggressive destroyer because it's got no protection <laughs> if um and then at some point you know it's almost like they had a mini revolution without telling anyone and guillotined everybody all the previous ship designers because then all you get to the era of dunkirk and suddenly they start turning out dunkirk strasbourg Algerie, um, various of the Contratorpilia super destroyers, and Richelieu and uh, Jean Bar. And now they're all these achingly beautiful, highly capable warships, some of which are absolutely top of their, cl uh, of their gr class grouping. And you're like, where was this for the last 50 years? <laughs> I, I mean, my money would be on like, you know, maybe, maybe the, uh, Maybe the uh, during the uh, tumultuous times of the '30s in Italy, with the fascists mm. taking over, like the Italian stylists were like, "Not, we're we are going to France. We're a better place. We're gonna build, we're gonna build <laughs> stuff over here." Because <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> you're not wrong. The French battleships aren't exactly uh, aren't exactly stellar until <laughs> until, no. until that. But yeah, I mean, right? Jean Jean Barr is an interesting one actually, because um, obviously initially not complete. Then on Vichy's side then gets beaten up fighting USS Massachusetts. She's not actually completed till after the war. Um, so she's in this slightly bizarre position of Vanguard is the last battleship. It's the last battleship laid down, launched and commissioned. Um, but Jean Barr is the last battleship to enter service because <laughs> they take so long fixing all the damage that she's taken in the Second World War. Uh, and then she goes on to serve for a reasonable amount of time. I'm I'm fairly partial to the Richelieu class, to be honest, if for no other reason than it allows me to point to a 15-inch armoured battleship that's not the Latorios and then point at Bismarck and go, see, see, you can do it better. <laughs> you can, you can. We, we, yeah, which is actually quite funny because you have the three 15-inch theoretically treaty battleships, none of which are quite treaty displacement, but Richelieu is the least offensive in that respect. And it's like... People go on and on and on and on and on about Bismarck, and I'm like, actually, of the three 15-inch armed 1930s battleship designs, Richelieu is the best. Like, yeah, Richelieu is the best. Littorio is pushing in for a close second, and Bismarck's kind of like, actually, you know, if I was if I was going to say Richelieu versus Bismarck or Littorio versus Bismarck, my money's going on the Italians and the French. <laughs> Which, when it comes to a game of military engineering, you really, really don't expect to say that, but like. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, because Deutsche Qualität is, oh, it's German battleship. Oh. Yeah, it'll take a while, it'll take a while to put the blasted thing down, but it won't take too long to render it combat ineffective. Uh, yes, we we fire our guns and the radar no longer works. Um, mm. I yeah, it's just it's, it's <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, to a certain extent, you see, I, I think. Taking on most German capital ships in in World War Two, and I mean, obviously, you've made, mostly the people look at Bismarck and Scharnhorst. A lot of it, after a while, it starts to feel like kicking someone while they're down. Yeah, yeah, it's it just really like is. It, 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 it took like three punches to get this guy on the floor, and now we're kicking him. And then afterwards, people are like, no, no, that guy was really, really durable. It's like, well, what do you mean? Well, his arm didn't fall off when you kicked him. It's like, yes, I'm not aware that that's supposed to be what happens. He, he's still supposed to be able to punch me back, but he just doesn't. Yeah, he can't. just curls up, in a, curls up in a ball while you're just like gradually grinding him into the pavement or something. <laughs> I mean, speaking of tough battleships that just won't die, or at least let's mm. uh, switch it up to our rival franchise. <laughs> 
Uchu no Senkan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Ah, uh, Imperial Japanese battleship Yamato. Now, uh, Apparently dressed by someone with a can of spray paint and a spare wedding veil. <laughs> yeah, um... <laughs> Known uh, ominously, uh, ominously, not ominously, uh, mm. known uh, in the uh, weeb community, the weeb ship girl community mm. for having uh, huge trucks of land. Um, mm. And in the anime of Kankole, she basically sits and can't move half the time because the entire crew needs to get her food and ramen to uh, <laughs> be able to move her because yeah. she sits there like everyone else is eating like in their sort of cute moe scenes they're sort of eating yeah. everyone is eating three rice balls and then you see yamato who's got like 12 or 13 stacked up and <laughs> just, like 18 cans of ramen just like oh yeah i need all this just to walk to the end of the hallway it's just so like yeah so the yamato like the... class battleship <laughs> yeah i like the little fire control headband that's quite cool <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, I didn't realize I mean, she's that... got the chrysanthemum on her collar. That's a nice call out. Yeah, the golden chrysanthemum that the Japanese warships have to have. And of course, she doesn't have her rigging out in this shot, but of course, she's got no. the the guns and stuff like that. So Yamato is. Uh... Yeah, look, I'm gonna have to blur that uh, mid roof mm. section. That's a bit racier yes. than I thought it was originally. But um, welcome to the joys of being an anime YouTuber. Um. Mm -hmm. Like, the the Yamato class is one of those interesting ones where, you know, it's sort of like the Japanese Navy built these two massive capital ships to sort of rule the seas, mm -hmm. and both of them just got murdered. Just, yes. Just brutally murdered. Mm. My next video oh, opens with, the, with Musashi getting murdered, basically. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the, the funny thing is that, you know, when you look at the the way that they died, especially well, either one of them is, but especially Yamato, because the Yamato is kind of its whole thing. When Musashi gets sunk as part of a much larger operation, Yamato goes down on her own operation. Um, but when you look at, at at the amount of aircraft committed and the tonnage of the aircraft carriers that were committed to to sink her. In some ways, it's kind of a vindication of her design. Because if you add up the tonnage of the carriers that were necessary to put the air group in the air that actually put Yamato down, that actually vastly exceeds Yamato's tonnage. So it's like if you converted that tonnage into battleships, you'd be talking about throwing like three Iowas at her or near enough, at which point it's like, Okay, fair play. Yeah, she, you, she, Yamato would have gone down facing three Iowas just as easily as if she went down facing off against five fleet carriers. It's that's not exactly rocket science, um, it, it, but it has always intrigued me. Of kind of like, okay, what if you put Yamato up against her weight in aircraft carriers, which would be like two Essexes, and then all of a sudden I'm looking at. Actually, I'm not necessarily sure she you would be able to put her down. I mean, or well, you you eventually you could, but would you do it in time to stop her getting to her destination with just two carriers? Because that that that's fighting equal and fair, at least tonnage wise. Um, obviously, the U.S. Navy doesn't have to fight equal and fair. <laughs> um, Hell no. Which is but which is the whole joy of it. But um, yeah, when when you look at the that they're kind of design of being able to outmatch and brutalize other things either below or at their tonnage they're not actually awful ships and their anti-aircraft batteries are appalling <laughs> but they're incredibly durable for what they are but a yamato class with american aa would have been something mm. i'm gonna be honest. oh yeah but i don't think i mean <laughs> that, that this again is like i know i know we're dunking a lot on the bismarck but hey why not i can um but you know, look <laughs> People are like, oh, Bismarck stayed afloat for so long. It's like, not really. Don't like, there are ships. Don't listen to the mean men. Don't listen to the mean men. <laughs> <laughs> like, there are ships at Pearl Harbor that stayed afloat longer than Bismarck did. Hiroshima stayed afloat longer than Bismarck did. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Drax out here throwing shade. God damn. Yeah. God. Yeah, Yabato, Yabato stayed afloat a hell of a lot longer than Bismarck, <laughs> and that was after the Americans had, had invented special tactics to make sure she went down. Musashi took forever and a day to kill. 
because it turned out letting in water both sides it just very slowly settled <laughs> Uh, with, the, with the Yamato, they were like, no, you must all go off to one side to make her cap size because it's just going to take too long to get enough water in there to make her <laughs> lose buoyancy. Yeah, like, the, the big thing, of course, is sort of like, it, it kind of makes sense for the Japanese perspective though, because they don't have the production capacity to sort of match the... They're just sort of thinking... Nah. They're just sort of thinking, if we're going to compete with the US and the Royal Navy, we're just going to mm. make... We're going to make a lot of large capacity aircraft carriers... And for our battleships, mm. we're going to make some really big ones. So we're going yeah. so we're going to try and build as many carriers as we can with as big an air group as we can. Um, we may skimp on some of the safety features, but hey, that's nothing new with Japanese aviation. Mm. Um, but we'll just build a couple of massive battleships. We'll build a bunch of cruisers to protect them, and then as many aircraft carriers as we can. And it works for a couple couple months and then it did yeah it didn't yeah i mean to be fair the japanese do catch a couple of unlucky breaks um yeah. which which re which really do like you know with yamamoto saying he can give them six months to a year obviously they doesn't because they don't quite get that when with midway scuppers that plan but you know midway has a lot of lucky breaks going on um, if we're going to do Midway, as, as I, I want to talk skill. about Midway. If we're yeah. going to do Midway, we need to get one of the one of the representatives up, and of course, we're going to have to get the infamous the infamous leader of Akagi. Midway. There we are again. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, Akagi and Kaga are nine tail foxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See the sort of chrysanthemum, and as you can yeah. see, her sort of um, it's very it's a bit hard to see here, but maybe mm -hmm. I'll bring up Kaga actually. I think it's more. Um, mm -hmm. as you can see, they're sort of like magic spell casting. Ah, uh, the flight deck. Flight deck, yeah. right? So I'll put Kaga up here because she's mm -hmm. really pretty and really better for. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about Midway, so I want to yeah. hear your take on Midway as the sort of battle because we saw it with Jonathan Partial in your discussion. Mm -hmm. If you guys haven't watched that, leave this video. Go watch that one. It's Probably mm -hmm. more. It's more intellectually stimulating, but um, <laughs> <laughs> this is just for fun. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I sort of find that I want to know because this is a debate that my channel has. Because mm -hmm. I have become the the chief. I have become the chief man on the internet, at least this part of Naval History YouTube, who is the leader of the Admiral Nagamo Hate Club. Like, oh, I, I will quite happily become a card carrying member there. <laughs> like. Um, I hate I, I mean, hate Nagamo. All my homies hate Nagamo, right? <laughs> so, like, I want to hear your take on the Nagamo dilemma here, because so I mean, I, I I've been kind of dragged by various historians, including uh, including John Partial, into acknowledging that Nagumo got dealt a few short short hands, uh, and he did try and make the best of what he had to a and to a degree. I can see the argument. On the other hand he he does kind of drop the ball a, a fair bit <laughs> um you know it, uh, if if anything he's a bit indecisive at times which in most people wouldn't be too much of a character flaw but if you're an admiral of a fleet that has to make decisions make them now and not go back on them it's possibly one of the worst character flaws to have because at least at least if you're going to choose you know, even if you're going to choose badly, choose something. If if you if you're halfway between decisions, then you don't actually accomplish anything. It's better to accomplish something badly than not accomplish anything at all, <laughs> especially yeah. when it comes to naval warfare. A hundred percent. And this is this is what I was thinking. I'm gonna I'm gonna frame that. By the way, we have Drakinafel mm. being being caught in the culturally significant extreme British understatement. A bit indecisive. A bit. Yes. Yeah. The man <laughs> sits and vacillates on every decision. He's like, we're going to do mm. this. And then, no, actually, we're going to do this. And then um, Yamaguchi's just like, nah, bro, we, we got to go yeah. like, now. Like, like we're, we're, we're yeah. going like, to fix bayonets. We're going to fix bayonets on our <laughs> propeller hubs. We're going in. We're, like, yeah. Uh, I mean, well, one of the interesting things, it, it goes back a little to a little bit before Midway, but you've got the Indian Ocean Raid. AK he, he does Operation it again. C. He does it the same yeah. then too. <laughs> well, this is this is the funny thing because I've I, at some point probably next year I'm going to do a full full video on on that, and it's probably 
it, it probably is going to annoy a few people, but I went back into the National Archives and I dug up every single logbook, deck log, battle log, letter, report, paper, after action, etc., that I could find on the Eastern Fleet during the time that Somerville was in command in 1942 to make sure I'd, I'd left nothing un, untouched from, from that side of things. And I got the logs of every single ship that was involved in Operation C, including, you know, the day that everybody almost ran into each other. And it's surprising how, like, people are like, oh yeah, if Somerville hadn't altered course, then there would have been some kind of encounter. And then you look at the deck logs, it's like, it's surprising just how ready the British were for that, which is hilarious because both sides were going in with completely inaccurate information. And sheer luck and happenstance meant that they both, both sides thought that their information was still accurate because the Gubo thought there was a handful of British ships present. And once, yeah, and his recon efforts, they he failed to spot, um, uh, Force A, Warspite and the two armoured carriers and escorts, failed to spot them completely, which is amusing considering the distance was about half that that Midway would eventually be fought at, and you know, eventually at least they managed to spot the American aircraft carriers <laughs> in that. Um, and Somerville's force had, you know, he he thought he was facing two Japanese carriers, not the entire Kido Butai minus Kaga, but with the Congos as escort. Um, so some of it was going in thinking, oh, you know, they've got two carriers, I've got two carriers and a battleship, and if worse comes worse, the, the R-class are somewhere behind, they can follow, come up and help. So Somerville's perfectly happy to to launch into an attack if he can find them. And it's just, it's the sheer luck that, I think it's Hiryu has, like, the world's fastest cap launch response time. Because uh, these two albacores show up, and they're like, ah, Japanese ships. Um, and they found Carrier Division 2, um, Hiryu and Soryu. And so they're like, oh, we have found two carriers. That's what our intelligence says, because Carrier Division 2 has been detached. All the other carriers, plus the Congos, are you know 50 miles off that way, but no one spotted them. And they're just turning around, ready to uh, radio back and tell Somerville, which would have triggered this encounter. And then, yeah, some absolute hero on Hiryu manages to get a flight of zeros up in the air, in the time between spotting the albacores and the albacores verifying what they've seen and turning back, the Zeros shoot down one of them and uh, knock out the other's radio. So by the time it gets back to tell Somerville what's happening, um, it's too late. He's already changed course and everything. But for the purposes of this upcoming video, I sat down and I wargamed out what could have happened if one or the other albacore had gotten a radio transmission off. <laughs> and Nagumo has no idea that, that, that Somerville is coming. And obviously you get the full gamut of things. It could be a Japanese disaster, it could be a British disaster. But eventually the when you run the thing enough times and you end up, you know, with a, a an average outcome, not only do you end up with basically Warspite pulling a Cape Matapan on Hiryu and Soryu, but you end up in this slightly bizarre situation, because of course at this point they've both got you know, the British ships have got radar. Nagumo is going to see Carrier Division 2 go up in flames on the horizon. He's going to have to send someone to investigate. That Whoever those are, probably a couple of Congos, are going to be spotted on radar. So now Warspite and a couple of cruisers have got to w figure out how to lay an ambush so that they can take on two battle cruisers with one battleship, which is going to be, and, yeah, and some torpedo carrying escorts, which is going to be an interesting fight. But then Somerville's left with the problem of, well, how do I finish off these two carriers? because they'll be on fire, but you can't guarantee they're going to sink. Um, and the last thing you want to do is leave them to potentially, you know, either put the fires out and get aircraft off in the morning or just limp away damaged. And so you keep coming back to this slightly bizarre scenario where you've got Warspite Enterprise and I forget what the other cruiser's name is offhand, hunting a couple of Congos through the darkness off to one side. And then um, I think it's formidable and indomitable going up and sinking Hiryu and Soryu with broadsides from their 4.5 inch guns. <laughs> which would then leave you with like the world's first carrier versus carrier conflict is a surface gunfight. <laughs> Drive which me would closer. Thoroughly... I want to hit yeah. them with my sword. 
Can you imagine the history of carrier versus carrier battles? How confused everyone would be if the prelude to Coral Sea and Midway was a gun match slugging fest between armored British armored carriers and Japanese carriers at the in, at night in the Indian Ocean. If I may, if I may import a meme here, I'm gonna mm. I'm gonna bring up our next pair pair of girls here because it's a pair of them. Um, it would be these girls in case because. Okay. The, the guys, yeah. the guys who built Saratoga and Lexington with those massive deck mm -hmm. guns, vindication. Should, yep. <laughs> yep. So again, we have our two wonderful Lexington and Saratoga, mm -hmm. uh, and you can see on the funnel, you've got the mm -hmm. you've got the black stripe the on stripe. one, but not all the yeah. other. Yeah. Um, that's a very interesting. It's, it's a very interesting segue into that because mm. putting guns on an aircraft carrier to us now seems mm -hmm. like a ridiculous idea but yeah it didn't seem so stupid back in the earlier days no i mean i've done two i've done two videos so far on u.s navy fleet problems and i think there's probably another two in the, at least another two in that series because the fleet problems get more and more intense and diverse as you go through the 30s but you know in the first few fleet problems that lexington and saratoga take part in they run into semi-persistent issues especially because obviously you can imagine 19 early 1930s biplanes and so forth their strike range isn't as great as it would become and they're operating relatively either relatively close to the front lines or in some cases when they're in detached in scouting forces they are part of the front lines and a number of times you end up with either lexington or saratoga either in a running gunfight with a cruiser or two um, or occasionally stumbling into range of the other size battleships. And everyone's looking at these and going, and, you know, initially people have kind of seen this happen, well, foreseen this happening, which is why they've got these eight inch guns in the first place. And that, and then you see all these fleet problems and they're thinking, yeah, actually, no, this is entire, you know, we're doing all these complicated fleet exercises and they're constantly running into enemy surface warships. We need to have these guns in place. Um, and it's only really when you get to the towards the end of the 1930s, once you start to introduce monoplane fighters and strike aircraft, which have considerably longer ranges, the that means the carriers can stay further back. And also the US Navy in the 30s obviously completes a fairly large building program of light cruisers and destroyers so that the carriers can have a more meaningful escort group. And then all of a sudden they're like, OK, well, maybe we don't have to worry about it too much. Because if we do run, obviously they're faster than enemy battleships, and if we do run into enemy cruisers, we've got this whole escort screen that can hopefully deal with it. But even so, the worry of running into a surface action with an aircraft carrier is there enough that when they're building the Yorktowns, when they're building Wasp, when and even when they're building the Essexes, there's a loud minority arguing that maybe we should put something heavier than the five inch 38 on them of course um, they, silly, but <laughs> yeah they don't, they don't win the argument but it's surprising how close it gets um and partially because the japanese are a little bit more cautious than than you might than pre-war estimates might otherwise make you think but they end up not needing the surface guns on Lexington and Saratoga, but it, again, it's kind of when you look at some of the scenarios they wind up in. Obviously, Saratoga more than Lexington because Lexington goes out fairly early in the war. There's a few cases where you know a twist of fate here or there could have seen them needing them. Yeah, I mean, that's the one thing about Saratoga. She she doesn't get as much lionization as she really should. I mean, even I'm guilty mm. of not giving her a due enough, mm. but she's sort of she's staying in there alongside enterprise the whole the whole time and she yeah just, she just keeps getting a run of bad luck she just gets hit by every yeah i mean sun. saratoga and enterprise both take a lot of hits and they obviously both survive the the problem i think for saratoga is she's a much larger ship so the repair job is always going to be a bit more complicated and she does tend to take slightly heavier hits like she gets torpedoed yeah. at one point which puts her out of action for quite a while um whereas enterprise generally only ever gets hit by bombs and the japanese bombs are not 
I mean, obviously they cause damage. They make they end up you know she has to patch herself up and then eventually retire to get repaired. But the Japanese five hundred and fifty pound bomb in and of itself is not not exactly the world's greatest chip breaker. <laughs> Uh, if it comes in large numbers, fine, but, you know, it took like 20 hits to put down Hermes, <laughs> <laughs> which is this titchy little early 1920s thing. Hermes Hermes does her best, but uh, yeah, you know, she she really wasn't going to be able to stand up to that level of attack, not even... No, I mean, the, the, the one thing I always question with Hermes is why... I mean, which she's caught without aircraft. Yeah. But what? Why towards the end of her career were they loading her up with like nine swordfish? It's like you have no self-defense capability, and with the greatest will in the world, nine swordfish of which you can probably launch six at any given time are not. It's not exactly the world's greatest offensive strike package either. I mean, in an environment where you know the enemy is going to be around a fair bit, and you're beginning to get martlets, aka the wildcat, in. Hermes, if any ship was was the, going to be the candidate, Hermes would be the ship I'd stick like sixteen, eighteen martlets on and go here. We have a fighter carrier. Yeah, we just yeah. The the old F four F is a is a mm. very is a very good weapon system for that sort of thing. It's it's again, she's she's the hero of the uh, American Naval Air Service for a reason for that period. But mm. she gets a lot of bad rap in her in her combat with the Zero for being less maneuverable. The Zero. Um, the video you did with that gentleman was absolutely mm. incredible. That three hours long, yes, with over a million views too. Just absolutely biblical video. Um, mm -hmm. The zero has this sort of lionized mythical status, and it really mm. does deserve it. But at the same time, the F, the the old F four F does seem to get a bit overshadowed somewhat, especially when you look at the combat performance. Of the wildcat, yeah. the wildcat does exceptionally well. Um, a lot of it comes down to just it's more comes down to sheer pilot experience than anything else. Japanese um, naval Japanese, air service were crazy. Yeah, they've got the they've got an incredibly high standard for when they're getting their pilots in the first place. Like you, you, they wash out candidates who would have been mid to strong tier candidates in anyone else's naval aviation um, training programs. And they also have, to a limited, I mean, it's not quite the same as full-on fleet carrier battles, but they do have a reasonable degree of combat experience fighting over China. So you've got highly trained, at the start of the war, you've got very highly trained pilots with a combat experience. And after Pearl Harbor, they're on the front foot. A lot of the time they have the numerical superiority as well, which helps. Um, but, you know, as as I think almost any you know, actual pilot, combat pilot would say the the pilot is the key mechanism there. You yes. know, you can have you can have a theoretically technically superior machine, but if you've got a worse pilot, then that machine is probably not coming home. And as the as you said, as the American pilots start to build up their experience, initially they they take some pastings and. Uh, over the Guadalcanal campaign, they have serious issues with fighter control direction. You know, at, at one point in one of the Guadalcanal air battles, they have 50 wildcats up, which should be able to completely shred the incoming Japanese attacks. But they have all the direct, all the, the onboard fighter direction capability of a wombat. So, hey, not, like, don't, you, don't you worry <laughs> about the wombat. The wombat is a scary <laughs> motherfucker. He'll, he'll, like, he's more dangerous yeah. than you will give it credit for. But I get what you're not, coming from. Yeah, but not not really known for his air traffic control capabilities. That's what <laughs> so, we have the um, emus for, for, and they're flightless. Yeah, yeah. Well, I saw I saw a beam live. There's like you you have triggered the my fight or flight complex, and I'm a flightless bird. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is rather yeah. incredible the naval battle of Guadalcanal. I, the 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 fighter direction, given how effective American air control is later, mm. it's it's yes. kind of amazing. The Japanese had this really low tech kind of ebb throughout the entire mm. air, air war at least like i can't find much reference of japanese ships with like radar at all like, very little. no they, they, they're a little bit behind on radar generally uh they do de they actually have a surprising number of land-based radars deployed earlier than you might think but it, they're still a little they're still a step behind in a lot of ways and Towards the end of the war, they have 
they do have radar, but the, the end of the war Japanese radar is comparable to like the 1940, 1941 Allied radar in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so it's like Yamato has, at the Battle of um, Samar, Yamato has radar, but it's a general search radar. Yeah, it's not it's fire not, they, she doesn't have fire control radar. She can use it to inform fire control, but it's not a full fire control radar. Um, whereas by that point, the British and Americans are on like generation three fire control radar. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And, and the, the thing is, the Japanese, when they go into the war with their carrier fleets, they have the, their two main strengths, other than experienced pilots, is the fact they know how to conduct multiple flight deck carrier ops. Yeah. And they know how to do it quickly. So they can very quickly put a very large, very scary strike package into the sky. And they can do that consistently. Whereas the British, they can't put a large strike package into the sky purely because they, in the early part of the war, they just don't have that many aircraft on their carriers in the first place. Um, and they don't have usually more than one carrier in any one place because they're trying to fight in three different places at once. And the Americans can put together reasonable numbers of flight decks, but they rely on each carrier working as an individual, which means you launch one set of planes, then you launch another set of planes, and then you launch another set of planes, and the first set of planes are circling, waiting for their fuel to run out while the third set are on flight deck. Um, and then obviously they go out with all different fuel loads, and it's it's a complete mess. And they're right. beginning to rectify this at Guadalcanal, but no, they haven't entirely fixed it. And so when you see it, like, you get what... It's it's incredible it worked given the uh, given what mm. we know about the battle now, but it's what happened at Midway where, like, the massive American like the Japanese hit with like sixty seventy aircraft, and mm. yet the Americans are attacking the Japanese fleet in twosies and threesies, coming in in different mm. directions. It's what's interesting I find is uh, it 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 goes back to the old saying you know the Americans tend to prevail tend to prevail in war because they practice. They practice chaos and war is chaos. Uh, they, yeah. sort of, they sort of, they don't have a plan. Like the Japanese have this massive set piece battle. It's all planned out. We mm. know exactly. The carriers are going to launch here. They're going to, the flights are going to rendezvous here. And then they're going to hit here. And everything's going to, the moment one thing goes wrong in that entire plan, the entire Japanese order chain, like command cycle just goes crunch. Yeah. And Nagamo's yeah. like, what am I going to do? I don't know. The plan. Yeah, it's what happened the, to my plan? The, 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 the main problem with the Japanese plans is um, that that they rely on the other they rely on the other um, side complying with their plans. The and if there's there. one thing the Americans are going to do is, <laughs> is they're not going to comply with you in any way, shape, or form. But but, but when it comes to the um, you know sort of looping back to the zero and the, and the, the carrier battles, the zero. It has its strengths, but as I said, a lot of the zero strengths come more from the pilots than the aircraft itself. It's an incredibly fragile aircraft. It's got certain degrees of performance, but it, its weaponry is not brilliant. Um, the twenty millimeter cannon that the Japanese have. Yeah. Oh God, ballistics no. are terrible. <laughs> yeah. So and and it, it's the thing is like um, it's like especially for 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 yourself perhaps you you get the the whole controversy of zero zeros over darwin yeah yeah and it's you know again it's the a lot of it where people are like oh no yeah the zero was better than spitfire no it really was. even the tropicalized mark V spitfire was actually a superior aircraft to the zero the problem was that most of the pilots who were defending darwin were operating on like 1938 battle tactics and had never seen a hostile aircraft so shockingly, they came across against a bunch of combat veteran zeros and didn't do so well. But one of the uh, Australian Air Force squadron leaders, who's up there flying his his Mark V C, and he knows how to fly. He's been he, he I think he had some time in the Desert War. Yeah. So he knew how to fly, and he absolutely monsters the zeros. So the only reason he basically doesn't clean up solo is because he's on his own so every time he's got a bead on one zero another's wingman is coming to pry him off the back um but he he's an absolute menace the zeros can't they can't keep up with him they can't shoot him down and if they leave him alone for five seconds he's sitting on their tail about to blow them out of the sky and it shows that actually you know in a in a straight up dog fight for all its vaunted capabilities this the the zero actually loses quite hard to the spitfire 
assuming the pilots are of an approximately equal skill level. This allows me to, because we're in my wheelhouse a little bit, this allows me mm. to nerd out slightly. The, the biggest issue that the Zero poses to an enemy plane in a BFM environment, basic fighter maneuver environment, mm. is the fact that the Zero weighs almost nothing. Weighs mm. almost nothing. And a, one thing that blows everybody's mind, even, even in naval operations, operating off carriers, and you would, the Allied pilots would never do this. Uh, Japanese pilots would remove the radios out of their aircraft to save weight, to, to get better performance, and would use hand signals like they had in the A5Ms over China, because they, they, they were well trained enough to do it by hand. They go, all right, you're in formation, you're in close formation with me, like, three, break off, do this, do all that, that sort of thing. The thing is, the idea of going into, a com into an air combat scenario with just hand signals is just especially not in sort of modern ACM air combat maneuvers because the Japanese sort of viewed the aerial combat scenario as a series of individual duels where you sort of you each pick your man and then you just go fight and then you sort of team up occasionally when you get the chance and you do all that sort of thing and it's great but the thing is with the zero the Zero has weighs nothing, and that's where it gets all its speed. But because it weighs nothing, its structural rigidity is also not high. Yeah. So, and its energy retention isn't very good either. No, it, it, will, it will break apart if you try and go into a heavy dive. It will break apart if you overexert the airframe and pull too many Gs. Mm. So you have to sort of keep it in the sort of golden ratio sweet spot where you're slow enough that the excess of G-force won't destroy the airframe, mm. but fast enough to still remain energy competitive with the bandit and if you're a spitfire and if you're a spitfire and even worse later on in the war as we see with the f4u and the f6f mm. all i have to do versus zeros i mean big quotation marks because this is simulated mm. this is simulated time yeah. not, not actual combat experience but combat veterans generally say the same thing um the way that you beat a zero is you is you try and get height on them and then you just keep your speed and as long as you can kick in the throttle mm. that zero will be in your in your rear view mirror and he'll just start fading away the spitfire yeah. the spitfire five against the a6m2 na is is one of those things where the the, the spitfire can outrun a zero quite comfortably it's got an inline it's got an inline merlin mm. trop variant quick it's just gonna go and with a zero, it's aerodynamic as hell. Flush rivets, beautiful. But that underpowered Sakai radial is just... It's, it's radial engine, so it's big and bulky at the front. Not very good for aerodynamics. And it's just not producing the power the Japanese need to get the oomph on it. So mm. you're right. Uh, Saburo Sakai mentions this in his autobiography, Samurai. Um, he, later on the war, in around... Iwo Jima, I think, he one mans against like 15 to 20 Hellcats, and he survives just by moving about the sky. Yeah. The only reason he says he lived is because the pilots of the, that was obviously a brand new squadron off like Leyte Golf or something, right? It was a mm -hmm. brand new carrier with a brand new air group, right? Yeah. If he had had, if he was saying like the S6F is way superior to my Zero. If they had a pilot half as good as me, they would have murdered me. Like, mm. flat out killed me. And yeah, every, the Japanese yeah. survive. You're right. The Japanese survive mm. just because their pilots are so good. But it's a dwindling mm. resource. They only get yes. like 10 new, good, new guys at that standard every year. And they start off with the same zero experience because they're now going straight yeah. into the meat grinder. And it just keeps yeah. dying and dying until the air yeah. service dies. <laughs> People, I mean, what, the, the kind of what remind, rem, reminded me of that the whole paradigm of like zero versus spitfire at one point was um i don't know if you saw the red bull air race they i think it was off the isle of white yeah yeah um where they got a spitfire in as a guest <laughs> and that was hilarious i mean admittedly it was a griffin engine one but you know the red bull air races are kind of the, they're almost the epitome of the the the, the tropes of the zero yeah. uh, incredibly lightweight incredibly agile um you know but not not the world's fastest um and it, it was such a hilarious air race 
to to watch because you had you know you come up to the turns and the Spitfire takes I mean admittedly it's also like a 70 year old aircraft so they're taking a bit more gentle than it necessarily could have done back when it was new but the the Spitfire's going into this graceful arcing turn of a couple of hundred yards radius and this Red Bull air racer sort of pops around and does like a nine yard circumference it's like skid turn round the round the pylon the old extra 300 doesn't miss around <laughs> Yeah, and, and just and then sort of he they're both heading off to the next one, and then but then the, once they're lined up, the Spitfire maybe has lost a few hundred yards, and then it's just like okay, and the Sp you can see the Spitfire pilot's just like okay, nice nice play, kiddo, opens the throttle and just goes powering past. <laughs> it's like well, I'm going to be at the next pylon, uh, and I'll have lunch and wait for you to catch up. <laughs> and this is the thing when you're in a modern like. The A, like, it's the old trope, and I don't like mm. to say the dogfight is dead. The dogfight will never be dead purely because the constant competing of technology, even with these modern missiles, ray guns, and God knows what. Mm. Everyone's working on a counter. Oh, I've got stealth. Oh, I've got a radar jammer that does this. Oh, I've done that. And then, even then, the, mod the age of modern conflicts, if one person breathes wrong, we have nuclear Armageddon. So nine times mm. out of ten, you're going to fly in closer to positively ID what you're shooting at, right? And so... Dogfights are always going to happen, but once an ACM engagement begins, it, really it is, it's a game of teamwork. The Germans demonstrate this beautifully. That's the one area where the Germans, doctrinally at least, outclassed everyone in the early phases of, excuse me, of World War II, is mm -hmm. because their pilots work in Rota, two men, and in yeah. Sharm, four men. And they're always on the radio, constantly talking. I'm high, you're low, I'm here, you're there. Where are we? Like, wingman up, shoot, kill, shoot, kill. Which is why we got pummeled earlier on. Mm -hmm. And the way the Japanese got pummeled once the Americans started adopting that is because the Royal Air Force and the Japanese flew in three. Mm -hmm. So you've got one guy who's off on his own. You've got mm -hmm. one guy looking at the front. And they sort of... It doesn't sort of jibe well. And so... The... Modern ACM engagement, at least in World War II, is the problem that the Japanese run into is when you're trying to do this sort of one-man stylish doing loops and rolls and I want to mm. dogfight the enemy and defeat him, the Americans are coming in like a football game and they're like, mm. okay, first wing goes in, dive, shoot, up. Second wing come in, dive, shoot, up. The Zero can't match that in speed and climb when they can. And even if they do... When they they're working in pairs, and when they're trying to get a shot, the thatch weave, like this, yeah, they can't shoot. So the Japanese fundamentally, in their psyche, in air warfare, never get past the knights of the air stick. They mm. never really get past it. They do work up on team tactics eventually, but like it's all very. All very one v one, mano mano, samurais at dawn kind yeah. of thing, and they. And to, to be honest, they're having to work with a lot of technological limitations there as well, because they're they're, they're fitted with radios. The Zero is initially fitted with radios. It's not a particularly good radio to start with. No. Then they they kind of haven't shielded it properly against the interference from the engines, and then something I found a few couple of years ago. Not only have they got this partially unshielded, relatively poor quality radio. They're also operating for the most part, especially in 42, 43 and the early part of 44, they're operating in an area of in intense um, atmospheric magnetic activity. Yeah. Basically the southwestern Pacific area, which is which is playing merry hell with everybody's radios to a certain extent. Radio communication range between allied aircraft is significantly reduced in in that operational zone. But the difference is the Allies have fairly decent radios to start with and they're properly shielded. So it's like, well, we can't talk with each other at 100 miles. We can only talk with each other at 50 miles. Whereas the Japanese are about like, well, we, I turn the radio on and all I hear is static and screaming. So yoink and out it goes. And it goes and we do hand signals. That's, yeah. that's one of the craziest things about that sort of growth. Like Japanese naval aviation, which speaking of, I'm going to bring up our next mm. pair of lovely ladies. You probably guess who's coming next by mm -hmm. me saying the pair. Here they are. Shikaku and Zuikaku. Mm -hmm. Yes. Recognize them straight away. Mm -hmm. That beautiful flight deck. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm talking about that, not everything else. Yes. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> not that they aren't beautiful flight decks, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. for those of you inclined. But um, this is the one thing that sort of gets me. 
Shokaku and Zuikaku tend as modern carriers, they mm. tended to perform way better than the other mm-hmm. than the other Japanese carriers of the war, at least from what I've seen of their combat records. I mean yes. one hit to any of the other Japanese carriers like the Hiryu and Soryu, mm. the Kagi Kaga, all of them, Taiho, mm. like they all blew up. I'm guessing it's because their air groups were airborne or already dead by the time the Par- Americans hit partially, them. Partially um partially uh, it's also to do with the fact that um Shikaku and Zuikaku at the start of the war are arguably the best carriers that anybody has. Uh because in some ways they're the carrier equivalent of Yamato and Musashi. Not quite to the same degree as Yamato and Musashi are compared to pre-war battleships, but everybody else has been building... You've either got conversions, yep. Courageous, Glorious, Furious, Lexington, Saratoga, and while Lexington and Saratoga are very good carriers, they are still limited to a certain degree by the fact they're conversions. There's certain inefficiencies inherent in that. Or you've got really small stuff, like Langley, which the Americans have given up on even using as a carrier at this point. Um, <laughs> Hermes, Eagle, Argus. Uh, then you've got compromise designs like Ranger, which the Americans don't want to risk in the Pacific. Wasp, which they do risk in the Pacific for all of five minutes. Um, and, and then it dies. explodes. <laughs> um, yeah. And then you've got York, the York towns, which again are good carriers, good purpose built carriers but are designed actually below treaty uh, displacement limitations because they're trying to get more carriers rather they're based the americans are after lexington saratoga they're basically i think it's you can have five ranger size carriers or four yorktown size carriers or three two or three full size carriers as far as the treaty displacement limits go and they prefer multiple flight decks, so they start off with Ranger, then they think, oh, that's not so good, so they go up the next stage, and that's how you get the Yorktowns. Um, and then over in Britain, you've got Ark Royal, which arguably, Ark Royal is an absolutely superb carrier design for the Pacific War, but ends up getting sunk by a U-boat before the Pacific War can start. Um, and then you've got the Armoured Carriers, which are much more designed for close-in fighting in the Mediterranean and the north that the, the north sea with the armored flight decks obviously there's a compromise there for their their flight group etc then basically the the british carriers are much more designed as as tanky ships they're designed to take hits they're actually got a much heavier anti-aircraft battery than anybody else's carriers do by a considerable margin at the start of the war um but they've had they've had to make compromises on air group size and so forth for that Whereas Shikaku and Zuikaku, um, as I said, they're designed under roughly the same paradigm as the the Yamatos are, where the Japanese go, you know, stuff the treaty limits. We're going to build the best carrier we can. So Shikaku and Zuikaku represent the first non-treaty limited designed from the ground up carriers that enter service. The next ones to enter service along those lines are the Essexes. Yeah. And so... With Shikaku and Zuikaku available pretty much from the start of the war, that they're, they're going to be so much better than anything else that the Japanese Navy has. And yeah, they're big, so they can take a hit or two. <laughs> they don't instantly explode. No. When hit by everything else. No. I mean, Taiho doesn't instantly explode, but Taiho suffers from a combination of being an armoured flight deck carrier. This is the thing, Shokaku and Zuikaku are, are not armoured flight deck. So if they took a hit similar to Taiho, they have a much better chance of venting the fumes that would eventually kill Taiho. Plus Taiho has the massive, massive, massive bad luck of some absolute genius deciding the best way to vent a bunch of petrochemical fumes in the hangar deck is to open up all the bulkhead hatches and ventilate the entire ship thus turning the entire ship into a fuel air bomb. Yeah, um, not exactly the greatest move. No, it's like, who who exactly was training your damage control of people on that particular day? Well, I'm just going to move that over there for our people there. So there we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yep. I ho Yes. Rather rather appropriate that she has a flame motif. Um, yes. <laughs> and a slightly psychotic look in her eye. <laughs> yeah. Um, he also, he also is exceedingly paranoid in her anime and video game appearances of Albacore. It, 
every time yeah. someone sneaks up on her she screams how cool oh my god like <laughs> <laughs> um it is it is rather inc- uh, the taiho story is rather an incredible one to me it's, it's sort of like for lack of a better word and a terrible pun it's sort of like the smoking gun people always sort of mm-hmm. um armored carrier sort of concept that the japanese went with but as you established in your video it's what mm. happens when you when you match a bunch of rookie crews with poor damage control practice if yes yeah it's like it, the, the level of damage control efforts that were put on taiho any carrier would have sunk i mean admittedly other carriers may not have had the same inbuilt sy- systemic flaws which caused her to be flooded with aviation ga- uh, fumes in gas fumes in the first place but fuel leaks weren't you know just because some ships had better designed aviation fuel systems doesn't mean that they didn't have aviation fuel leaks at points <laughs> absolutely not i mean of course we can see that like hmm. we'll bring it up here just for i want to wind it back a little bit because mm-hmm. i think our american friends will be kind of disenchanted to hear mm-hmm. that our lovely lady ark royal here um does had superior aa defense their ships because as we all know they're well, all about their <laughs> second amendment rights as you yeah. frequently put it um, <laughs> well it is it's an established fact i when i did the analysis of um you know uh, but basically armored carriers versus unarmored carriers as far as their flight decks went this was a few years ago i included arc royal as well because the arc royal is roughly contemporaneous with the york towns and it is just a simple fact when you look at the arc royal and the illustrious versus the york towns and even to a certain extent the early essexes and certainly wasp hornet um etc ton for ton and by sheer barrel count the british carriers have a lot more anti-aircraft firepower in both heavy and medium categories where the americans come in with the ridiculous numbers of guns we usually associate with them is again the late 1942 the guadalcanal campaign a lot of which is mostly down to enterprises officer one of enterprises officers basically constantly writing back asking for more 20 millimeter orlican uh initially he's just like we have some spare displacement and some spare deck space can we have some more 20 millimeter and then when they've used up all of that it's like do we, do we need as many planes as we've got? Can, can we can we put more more twenty millimeters on the flight deck? It's like no. Also, if we put more, the Earth ship might roll over. It's like well, we don't need as much belt armor. He's like literally he he's trying to pair Enterprise down to a floating tin floating tin shack full of aircraft and Orlicans. He yeah. he's prepared to sacrifice basically anything to get more anti aircraft firepower on his ship. Uh, when asked how many uh, twenty millimeters you want on your ship, his answer was yes. Um, yes yeah. yes i need i need orlicans more orlicans orlicans and it's rather interesting with arc royal she got killed by mm. a submarine um yes slowly rather, slowly but i mean everyone got off just right? mm. including yeah the, pretty much including the cat so the rumor goes yeah yeah i mean it was in in some ways if they hadn't ordered if the captain hadn't ordered abandoned ship quite so early they might have saved her because they'd have more people around to do damage control um but partly again in in a lot of ways she was killed by the treaty restrictions which is to say this is one of the reasons why chicago and zwicarko are so durable because they and the essexes as well because they're designed without those treaty restrictions in mind so arc royal's designed to be big she's designed to be fast she's designed to have a really large air group um but in order to get all of that and stay below the, the displacement limit set by the Washington Treaty, one of the things they end up compromising on is the way the ship is subdivided for water tightness. Uh, so they end up having a very long uh, longitudinal bulkhead running down the middle of the ship. Which, whereas what you should do is have that plus lateral bulkheads to divide up your machinery spaces a lot more tightly. But instead, she has some fairly large open areas. So when she then gets torpedoed, not only is there a lot of flooding um, eventually, but all that flooding is on one side, <laughs> which is why she heals over. Yeah. Um, ironically enough, if she hadn't had that bulkhead, although she would have had an even larger, more vulnerable space for taking on water, she probably wouldn't have sunk. Yeah. Because the, the, the flow rate in versus the flow rate out, plus the fact she was near Gibraltar, if she'd just been settling on an even keel, they probably could have gotten her in tow and gotten her back in. Yeah, get the um, on, just tow her out. Yeah. 
I, I do like actually there seems to be a bit of a nod to the uh, more recent Ark Royal as well. I don't know if that's intentional, but the in in her in her fists there in her right fist there she has what appears to be a pair of um, sea dart missiles. Yes, yes. <laughs> There's a, a nod to the more recent uh, Invincible class Ark Royal. Yeah, she's got like a very cool steampunk design. I really do like mm. Ark Royal's design, especially her sort of laser musket. It's it's rather cool. Yeah, I I do like. She has a very cool of, design. Yeah, and one of the few that actually hasn't gone with like massively long hair either. She just makes it makes it look a little bit more combat ready. Yeah, she she's ready to fight, and that's one mm. good thing. Um, her characterization in the anime is a bit, cool. um, mm -hmm. mainly because uh, she has a fondness for destroyers. Moving on. Uh, All right, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, moving um, swiftly on. Moving swiftly on. Although it does lead to a great scene in the actual TV anime, um, where she's like, "Oh, look, I'll help you up," or whatever, and Glowworm just headbutts her in the face, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is all rather wonderful, but. In honor to, um, I hope to become a mutual friend with this man, um, Ryan Shemansky from Battleship New Jersey. <laughs> yes. Uh, we are all well acquainted with, I assume, the, the guy. I, I believe uh, Battleship New Jersey's reaction to Azure Lane getting New Jersey was they made a Twitter post, which is at Azure Lane, yes, we know. Um, yes. <laughs> Please stop to remind us. <laughs> And when I eventually cover New Jersey, probably after mm. I, I cross 100k, I'm going to send Ryan an email and be like, hey, can mm. you do a forward for me? Because I, I, it would be wrong doing a video without Ryan here. Um, <laughs> but I did want to bring her up on that because you recently went on a trip to uh, yes. Battleship New Jersey. Yes. What, how did that go? Like, I, We've got the video up there. Yeah, yeah. It's it's um, It was absolutely great. I haven't put the full video up yet. Um, it's probably going to be one of the longer, if not the longest ones I do for the April trip, because i um, done Massachusetts this month. Next month is Olympia. And yes, so then December will be New Jersey. Christmas special, I guess. Christmas special. <laughs> Outstanding. But um, Yes, New Jersey was incredibly fun. You know, and, and you know it's similar in some ways to what we're talking about with aircraft where the pilot is the thing that makes it as much as the ship and you know not that you know 99.9 .9 percent of everyone that i met at the on the various ships wasn't wonderful they they all they all were incredibly helpful um but you know when you spend two days on new jersey with with ryan and he's you know not quite giving me the keys to the ship but basically just like where do you want to go um <laughs> there's a lot of places on battleships where I'm just like, I would like to go here mentally thinking, okay, you know, maybe they're going to say no. And it's like, okay, it's this way. It's like, really? <laughs> okay. I wasn't expecting that, but cool, but even better. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Uh, my best mate recently, uh, Texas, hi Scott. Mm. Um, he, he recently went to the battleship Iowa and I can mm -hmm. imagine that, Touring an Iowa class battleship has got to be like the pinnacle of like museum ship trip, like tour. Mm. Got to be, like, especially New Jersey, because she has. You could arguably say that New Jersey has the most history out of all the Iowas. Which is why she was, mm -hmm. why she was picked for the game. I'm assuming. Mm. But like, yeah, I, you you also have the other the other thing with New Jersey is that New Jersey is relatively fortunate. Um, so this is this is something of a little bit of museum ship lore, if you like, because obviously the Iowas were decommissioned in pairs. Yeah. Um, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, regulations on what they can and can't do and where people can and can't go are set at the time that the ship is handed over. The EPA, at the time that the first two uh, Iowas were sent to be museum ships, were far, 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 far less paranoid than the EPA was when the last two were set in place. Yeah. So, you know, New Jersey has that additional advantage of they, they physically can go and in some cases take guests to places that uh, the, the, the latter two simply can't. Yeah. Like, looking at her design in Azure Lane, you gotta, you mm. gotta pay heed to those massive 16 Mm-hmm. 
I, I don't and like plenty of private thirty eights as well. They're emphasizing the firepower quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, like America. Um, mm -hmm. this is freedom incarnate. Incarnate, like actually, no, that I'd say that's Enterprise, but close second. Enterprise, Enterprise, New Jersey tag team. There is fan art of that. Mm -hmm. Um, quite honestly, it, it's one of those things. Like the sixteen inch gun. What you, I've seen photos of that, and it wasn't until I got a photo from a mate of mine standing next to one of those guns, so just how big the main battery mm -hmm. on the Iowa is. It's kind yeah. of ridiculous. But, if we've got New Jersey, mm -hmm. we're going on, we'll start blazing through. I promised I'd get a couple of other good ones in here, so we've gone through most of them. Alright, I know who we need to bring up. Uh, we need to bring out for my boy Dojin. Let's bring her up. <laughs> Here we are. HMS Illustrious. In a nice summer hat. <laughs> In a nice summer hat. She's. I must admit, she is uh, She is a fan favorite, HMS Illustrious. Mm -hmm. One of the most oathed ships in the game. Yeah, because mm -hmm. what good is having a boat waifu unless you can actually make her your waifu? That's right. <laughs> we, need to sell her, we need to sell those figures and sell those body pillows, gentlemen. But, oh dear. <laughs> but yes, swordfish off the flight deck, very cool, yep. very cool. I mean, I've been meaning to make a video about illustrious for a while, but <laughs> it the whole Mediterranean theater of mm -hmm. like between the Regia Marina and the Royal Navy, what little there was of the Greeks Marine, I don't think there was that much. No, a few occasional U boats. The Flieger Corp Ten was more com was more more of a, the frequent problem. Definitely, definitely more of a threat than the Regia Aeronautica, in my experience. <laughs> yeah, the Regia Aeronautica is a bit of a weird one. Occasionally, they manage to pull off some fairly interesting things, but they're given the, the the fact that they absolutely refuse to cooperate with anyone who isn't a Regia Aeronautica officer kind of stymies them. Yeah. Um, to the to to the point that um. In, in the run-up to Cape Matapan, when the some RAF, I think it's some Blenheims, show up randomly, like, because, yeah, the, 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 to be fair, the coordination between the RAF and the Royal Navy isn't brilliant, but they do at least, you know, have the decency to tell each other when they're going to be conducting operations and where the enemy might be, even if they don't then coordinate strikes. But yeah, in the run-up to Matapan, I think it was this flight of Blenheims show up trying to do high al op opportunistic high altitude bombing at the same time that a handful of swordfish are going after the the ships and the italian admiral takes one look at this like the fact that they're even in the sky at the same time in the same place and immediately concludes that the royal navy and the raf must have fully coordinated strike forces and therefore you know, the air is lost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> simply because he can't possibly imagine the Regia Aeronautica actually showing up on the same day, <laughs> let alone in the same location as where his ships are. Yeah, um, no, never going to happen. Those That's assuming those Savio Machetis can even make it. Mm. I mean, I mean, like... late, later on they fly Stukas, which leads to a whole lot of confusion because obviously everyone sees Stukas and thinks, oh, they must be German. And okay, we're like, 30 40 percent of the time they are <laughs> the other the other rest of the time it's just a bunch of italians coming in to say hi as well yeah i mean the the, the only real success they they had in terms of aircraft design at least in my opinion is the uh mackie c202 and the 205 I mean, mm. the, the centauro i mean after that mm. it was a disaster actually kind of think of it rather ironically wasn't illustrious okay pretty sure she was wasn't it? um no i think that was formidable formidable I think so. I think that was formidable. Yeah, I, um, I think Illustrious was 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 um, sleeping off being bombed repeatedly by Flieger Corp Ten. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old Illustrious. Like Illustrious, her Illustrious matches her career now. She had a she had a couple mm. of big wins. I mean, but I I think what was it? Taranto. Taranto. That's that's mm. the big one. I think that's the big. Well, like Taranto is one of those times where I sort of look. The, the Italians get a lot of shade thrown at them for their World War II. Quite rightly so, if we're honest. But Taranto feels to me like a bit of a comedy of errors from an Italian perspective. At least. Well, um, I'll, the, Taranto in some ways is a success, but 
in a way that a lot of a lot of British successes in the war are. Um, basically, when when you look at British wartime successes in World War Two, a lot of them come down to one of two factors: either someone has just spent six months meticulously dotting every i and crossing every t and boxing people into a position where it's absolutely impossible for them not to win um like something like that yeah exactly the battle of el alamein he's just like i don't care where it's like the, we've got artillery okay we'll use artillery support to take out the Germans. so we don't know where the germans are bring enough artillery so it doesn't matter where they are <laughs> we're just going to erase entire grid squares and they're, they're in there somewhere <laughs> um so th that that's one way and then the other is usually someone doing something utterly insane refuge you know, like Narvik. <laughs> yeah refuge you know, like Narvik. no one in their right mind would take a battleship into a fjord to face off against destroyers but uh, Captain Crutchley does, and then you get the Third Battle of Narvik. Yeah, no one in their right mind would take a thirty-five thousand ton battleship and go, "I'm going to play it like it's a destroyer." But Captain Dalrymple Hamilton does, and as a result, he dances Rodney into punching range of Bismarck without getting hit. Um, and the same thing with Taranto. It's like no one in their right mind would fly would would stick a leaking, um, you know, a, a, a very leaky several hundred gallon tank of fuel in the observer position of a wooden fabric canvas canvas fabric biplane and fly through the night using star sights to swoop in and attack a modern naval base from you know every direction but the one that's the most obvious so for the poor italians it's just like it's, it was almost as an outside context problem because, you know, the, the, at some point when you're making your defences, you have to rely to a certain degree on no one is going to be insane enough to do X. And it just turns out that a lot of the time someone in the Royal Navy is, in fact, insane enough to do X. Uh, yes, um, no one would think about filling a destroyer full of C4 or the equivalent mm. at the time yeah. and then ramming it into a dock gate. No one's going to be dumb enough to do it. But yeah, they will. Mm. And they did. Like, yeah. It, that's like, Britain just does that on every single occasion. It, it's either a, mm. it's either a creeping barrage timed to the last millisecond, or some mm. guys fixed, like, as he said, some guy in Afghanistan, where we're pinned mm. down by a PKM. What do we do? I know, fix bayonets. Mm. And the Taliban are going, what? Why does he have a sword on the end of his rifle? <laughs> <laughs> so, but half of it is the intimidation factor because it, that's what you say. It's like if you're pinned down by a PKM, but, but with, if you're pinning someone down with PKM fire, you're thinking, okay, we've got the machine gun, they don't. We've got the range, they don't. And then they come popping up out of out of their cover with with knives on the front, screaming at you. It's like the one, the intimidation factor, but two, part of your mind's going to be. Going, what do they know that we don't? Yes. What, like, what is that? Why are they doing this? They must have a reason for doing this. And that reason, the fact that I don't know what that reason is, and it would, seems to otherwise fly in the face of all, all other reason, is deeply concerning and makes me worried and makes me want to leave. And it turns out there was no reason other than just stab them. <laughs> and I think that's the, that's that, that whole mentality is the undoing of the Japanese a lot of Because they, they, they can't fathom the tactical or strategic situation they're faced with because of an inherent cultural misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the data that they're looking at. And it's sort of, mm. it happens a lot. Um, like, I don't think, like, a lot of the times, like, the Americans ran into the same, the same thing. Like, there's a war game scenario which... I mean, I'll put up another waifu for the for the seething, unwashed masses as they are. Where are we? Oh, what have we got? Who haven't I put up? Oh, well, we're talking about the Imperial Japanese Navy. Let's, okay. put, let's put up Otago and Takao, shall we? Mm -hmm. we With their sword. Mm -hmm. um, the Japanese... There's a war game scenario which we've often discussed, which is... Um, the Japanese mentality behind Pearl Harbor was, as far as the writing goes reading a really good book let me bring up the um 
Let me bring up the title just so I make sure I get it right. No, not Tom Clancy's Red Storm Rising. Where are we? <laughs> hey, it's a good book. Um, The Rising Sun by John Toland. Massive historical epic. Um, He talks about the Japanese perspective of World War II and he talks about the sort of the psychological games that the Japanese were sort of thinking through in the lead up to Pearl Harbor. Talking about how they thought that the attack on Pearl Harbor would be a psychological shock mm. to the American, the American public. And that as a result, the American public will go, oh my God, this is too brutal, we quit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. However, it seems that in almost every single case throughout the Second World War, and at least regarding the Axis powers versus the Allies, the exact opposite of that tends to occur. Like, I mean, like, the, the, the obvious one we could talk about, at least in this, in the context of this discussion, would be um, uh, USS Johnston, mainly. Mm -hmm. In the fact that the Japanese force turned back after that engagement. Yeah. What would, like, you've done videos on that battle. You've mm -hmm. done several yeah <laughs> um like what's the sort of like what's the sort of thought process like what's the sort of game plan from the japanese perspective at that point what ju what did they use to justify their decision to turn around really all they had to do was sink that destroyer which they did and a couple of mm. other ships and then they can plow right into the transports part, part of it part of it was that the air attacks were increasing um so because you had taffy three which was obviously the the force that they were engaging um, but you also had Taffy 1 and Taffy 2. And bearing in mind at this point, the Japanese had no real idea about escort carriers. So you had some aircraft from Taffy 3 plus aircraft from Taffy's 1 and 2 eventually and, uh, uh, and so forth all showing up. And the attacks were a little bit disjointed, but that actually made them seem more numerous because there were always some, there was always someone flitting around overhead. And combine that with the misidentification of the escort carriers initially as fleet carriers, it left this impression that there was some other major fleet carrier element somewhere over the horizon that they weren't quite seeing that could be a problem. And I mean, in some ways, similar to what we were talking about with that bayonet charge, um, you've also got the fact that, you know, th this handful of destroyers and destroyer escorts have absolutely thrown themselves at the Japanese fleet and inflicted a completely disproportionate amount of damage and slowed everyone down and again it's this kind of thinking of okay nobody would do that logically unless there was some grander reason you know yeah. there was something that they again it's, this is what do they know that we don't and it, it seems at least from to Karita's mindset is he seems to possibly have thought you know if if these guys are attacking so hard and so fiercely, it must be because they have backup just over the horizon, and they're just trying to hold us off until until the the, the additional help gets here. Because surely nobody would just throw their lives away in a short, sharp battle against such overwhelming odds if they knew that it's basically just going to be a speed bump. Um, and at that point, com you know, combined with the losses he's already taken and the delay that's already caused, Karita's just like, I, I don't think it's safe to proceed. I don't think we'll, we'll, we'll make it. I mean, the, the slightly ironic thing is, of course, that if he had proceeded down and engaged the transports, um, I mean, it would have been an absolute mess. But the troops were sure um, one. The, most of them were, yeah. I mean, cutting them off from all their supplies, and there were still a bunch of troops in in, in ships, which you know, it wouldn't have been a pretty thing. But the delay would have actually, you know, in in some ways, Karita was right because you had Task Force Thirty Four, aka Admiral Lee's fast battleships, hammering their way back south after they'd finally managed to persuade Halsey to let him go. In the event, he shows up a few hours after Karita has left. But if Karita actually had pressed on further south, Lee wouldn't have shown up soon enough to stop him butchering a bunch of transport ships and supply ships, but he would have shown up quickly enough to block the San Bernardino Strait and make it impossible for the Japanese to retreat. 
Um, no, at which man. point it would have been a case of either you're coming to us or we're coming to you. Um, which one do you want? For that, for that sort of, for that moment, I think what I'll do is I'll bring up uh, over here. Finally, we'll bring up, mm -hmm. we'll bring up the U.S. battleship line. The gun club. <laughs> we got the gun club. So we've got, we've got Nevada on the right. We've got Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. We've got Pennsylvania, Arizona, California, and to my shame, I think that's Utah. Um, <laughs> but we've got the uh, we've got the battleships all with their their towers, their superstructures there, and mm -hmm. all with their guns. I mean, realistically speaking, the U the U.S. battleship force that was sunk at Pearl Harbor all basically came back with the exception of two right mm -hmm. all of them except no, well yeah Utah three if you can count Utah but she was a training ship by that point anyway so yeah in terms of line combat ships Oklahoma and Arizona are the ones that don't don't come out of it one question I'm <laughs> gonna put to you here is something that I've always wanted and you're an expert so I'll ask you at least mm -hmm. in this regard what effect would it, the big war game I was talking about before is the miscalculation of the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor. The alternate mm -hmm. strategy, of course, would be to pursue the um, sort of Vietnam, Iraq kind of strategy, Afghanistan strategy, which is you attack south and take the Middle East, like the, not the Middle East, no, the Malaysian Peninsula, the oil, the rubber, mm -hmm. the stuff that you need to keep fighting in China. You yeah. take that and you bypass the Philippines. Yes, it would create mm -hmm. a very dangerous base and long supply lines, mm -hmm. but it would force Roosevelt into the fait accompli if he would have to declare war on you. You're not declaring mm -hmm. war first, which would be a lot harder to justify to the American public if you haven't been bombed, right? Mm -hmm. So the question I have, say they follow that path. Say they don't attack Pearl Harbor. They follow a conventional mm -hmm. expansion and take the natural resources they need. Roosevelt says, oh, you're declaring war on Britain. You're, you're, you're pushing your influence mm. too far. We're declaring war on you now. And the American battleship fleet does sortie, and we do see the American battleships. What kind of effect do you think that the American battleship fleet would have, really? I mean... Tough question. I think I some, of the, the, some of the American viewers might hate this, but, you know, if the American battle fleet had sailed for the Philippines... Which, to be fair, their war plan by 1941 didn't call for. Their war plan by 1941 assumed that the Japanese would take multiple islands and they'd have to do a version of the island hopping campaign that we saw. Um, but, you know, if the Japanese aren't taking all these islands and they are just ignoring them, they, I guess maybe at that point, like, okay, well, I guess we fall back on going over to the Philippines and kicking them, kicking them uh, while they're looking the other way. Given the issues with US damage control and ship state maintenance that Pearl Harbor exposed and which they corrected as a result of it. I think the battle line sailing probably would have been the single worst thing they could have done. Because that's exactly what the Japanese wanted them to do. Yeah. That's what the Japanese had spent 20 years training for. And when you, okay, if they're underway, they're going to be slightly harder targets than, you know, if they're in, uh, if they're stationary in Pearl Harbor. But at the same time, um, an awful lot of the Kates that went in were equipped with bombs rather than torpedoes. So the, the Japanese carrier fleet could put up a lot more torpedo bombers if they wanted to. The state of US fighter, as a fighter control direction and anti-aircraft at the very beginning of 1942 was not anywhere close to what it would be later in the war or even what it would be towards the end of the year. I have a feeling that if they tried to sail and the Japanese knew they were coming, then an awful lot of them would have ended up at the bottom of the Pacific in places where they couldn't be recovered. And of course, um, facing ironically the same fate that the Japanese battle fleet which is yeah. you're faced with the with the Kido Butai, you're you're gonna find out that battleships don't cut it when you've got that many torpedo bombers coming at you. It, mm. It's it's very interesting. It's very interesting looking at the Pacific War. I find it was one of the biggest revelations coming over. Like I I had an aviation focus, so I knew about the aviation side of things. But I, 
when I started delving into the Pacific War, it really sort of amazed me just how short-handed the U.S. carrier fleet was at the start of the war versus how it was when it when it ended. Mm. The United States had enough carriers for the entire world's navies combined. Yeah, they were still producing more. So the idea that it was in fact Imperial Japan that dominated naval aviation in this period is kind of well. You can make arguments that the Royal Navy did all, but <laughs> I would say that in terms of doctrine, like carrier operations today now with the carrier battle group, it's far closer to Japan's ideology of yeah, carrier it, it, in, warfare. I think in terms of having a doctrine, in terms of an anti, anti-shipping strike doctrine combined with the capability to actually carry it out, the Japanese were the top tier at the start of 1942. Um, the American carrier doctrine had a long way to come. Admittedly, they learned very quickly. Um, but, you know, even even in in the very late part of 1942 with e um, Eastern Solomons and Santa Cruz, even at that point, the Americans are relying partly on lucky breaks and partly on a technical edge rather than a doctrinal edge. And the Royal Navy in theory, has the better and more advanced doctrine because they also have a multi-carrier flight deck strike package doctrine like the Japanese do, as opposed to the single deck doctrine the Americans do. But on top of that, the Royal Navy does have the night strike doctrine yeah. using radar and flares, which no one else does because no one else has airborne radar apart from anything else. But the problem with the Royal Navy is, you know, apart from... Before, even before you get into numbers of aircraft on deck and so forth, the simple fact is the Royal Navy doesn't have the ability to execute that doctrine, partly because a lot of its opponents keep refusing to come out to see where they can be easily torpedoed in mass numbers, um, and partly because the Royal Navy's carrier force is stretched all over the place. So even, even if they have a multi-flight deck strike doctrine, they just don't have multiple flight decks to strike from. Um, in any given location, whereas the Japanese do, so they're able to carry that forward. That's one thing that the Japanese always seem to have an advantage in, is they always kept their force closed fist, like that, part of Kantai Kesson. Mm. And sort of, they, they always, they're always able to mass a lot of force really quickly at the point of contact, but they they just get, they they always get undone by their by their sort of overall strategic misinterpretation and their tactical indecisiveness when the plan that they planned so heavily on doesn't go the way they thought it was like looking at like the i mean i spend half my time on my channel complaining about operation market guard i go on mm -hmm. rants when you look at operation mi and all the moving parts the japanese had to put in place like the logistical like to do all of that with outdated communications equipment on a timetable, on a timesheet, especially when the, well, they don't know it, of course, especially when the enemy can read your mail, it's kind of one of those things where you look at it and you go, it's a miracle that the Japanese actually managed anything at all, because the logistical and technical and operational considerations of what they were attempting to accomplish seems way beyond what they were actually capable of doing. I mean, you can say that about the Kriegsmarine too, but I, mm. despite being the superior naval power, I think the Japanese suffered from that way more. Honest. I think, yeah, I think the Japanese suffered particularly from going completely over the top with complexity, because they have this entire diversionary um, thing going on to the north, which nobody buys. You know, no, one, no one's taking the bait. And you know, to be perfectly honest, what's the point? Because the Japanese, they think Yorktown's been sunk. So they think at most they're going to come across two aircraft carriers. And, you know, the, that's the thing that, I mean, obviously there are reasons published, but if, I'm, if you look, look at it from first principles, it is puzzling why they ever thought they even needed the diversionary attack. Because if you, if you look at them, if the Americans have two carriers, then the force they send to Midway is already strong enough. You don't need to divert the Americans away from it. Yeah. You want the Americans to come to you. At which point, if you want the Americans to come to you, just take everything. Yeah, bring everything. Because, 
bring everyone like don't bother with this silly little diversion mission take everything you possibly can to this one attack and then either the americans confront you and get horribly destroyed or they don't confront you and you get a free island gonna be um honest. gonna be honest those extra carriers they those escort carriers they had for operation al mm. those fighter cap that fighter cap would have been really useful <laughs> would have yeah been handy. yeah <laughs> yeah and and I mean, to be honest, the, if, if I was going to nitpick any one particular mistake within what they actually did at Midway, um, I would probably go with just the first strike that they, the first airstrike they did on Midway Island itself. Because it's, you're using, carry, you're using single engine carrier aircraft with, and, and you're not even talking about American, like if if it was... If the situation was reversed and we were talking about an American air, for, air fleet going in to attack Midway, I could kind of get it because Dauntless is loaded with thousand pound bombs can probably mess up a lot of stuff. Yes. But if you're going in with like little 25 pound, effectively not quite cluster bombs and up to 250 and 550 pound bombs, you know, you've got to know that's not going to do a tremendous amount to any seriously dug in emplacements or whatever without a direct hit, um, and possibly even then. So, why? You know, uh, mount, at a, best, mount a combat air patrol and wait for the battleships to show up and flatten the island. Yeah, <laughs> at absolute best, I'd maybe send in a few fighter sweeps to suppress some of the, like, because obviously it's like open atoll. So be like, okay, if they've got some open emplacement guns or something, send some zeros to just strafe the crews, make the landing easier. But, you know, you know you've got Yamato in the back with a bunch of other capital ships bringing up the invasion forces. The, the, the battleships can probably put down far more explosive um, in far quicker time with about as much accuracy as level bombing kates can so you know why bother just keep keep your aircraft all loaded up in case the americans show up and be happy with that that and of course the, the one of the big things that john puts points out in his book is that yamato because they had the flagship with them, they had to detail like half their cruisers to cover the flagship which means mm. kido butai is missing half its aa screen it's also missing half its recon air like which is not helping mm. Not helping at all. Yeah. No, but I mean, it's the 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 whole thing is it's when someone gets too 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 deep in their own cleverness and the plan gets far too complex. That's that's when you start to run into issues. Uh, you know, if if you have a plan, I mean, you need you need a certain level of comple operational complexity to plans. To be fair, because you don't want your enemy to just immediately guess what you're doing. And you need a little bit of flexibility, but th th there's a limit to that. You, you've got to be able to just turn around and go, you know, if I can't explain my plan easily to you in under 60 seconds, you know, the elevator pitch kind of thing. Yeah. If I can't explain the, the entirety of my plans to you in 60 seconds, this plan is too complex because there's too many things that can go wrong. Simple operational concept logic. I mean, mm. Class of its touches on it. I mean, I'm not going to go full nerd on that. Otherwise, we'll be here all week. We've been here for a while as it is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a quick rapid fire for Drag here because mm -hmm. I'm seeing he's starting yep. to get tired. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we both are, actually. It's almost 3 a.m. here. Um, so, rapid fire. Vestal. Mm -hmm. USS Vestal. Supply ship. Mm. Now, the thing about USS Vestal is um, me and my friends have had a conversation about this. Without USS Vestal, the US Navy loses the war. Any thoughts? <laughs> Uh, early on in the war, the U.S. is really up against it when it comes to fast oilers and supply vessels. Um, yeah, they definitely need everything they can get their hands on. Um, and I mean, the fact that she survives Pearl Harbor, considering where she is positioned, is a flipping miracle. Yeah, that, <laughs> Arizona should have taken her out. They should have split her in half. Mm. But, she's, but she's back in it and scolding Enterprise for constantly getting herself blown up. Um, <laughs> But Vestal is always there to bail her out, and so that's the one thing. Vestal is always hmm. there to get NT out of a jam, which is always so. Vestal MVP is my vote. Yeah, um, logistics. Logistics is what wins wars every time. Speaking of logistics winning wars, we'll bring up 
Where are they? Where are they? There they are. Okay. The Essex <laughs> sisters. <laughs> yes. Now, Essex... The leading wave. The leading wave. The Essex, the Essex class is one of those things that... When you look at the annals of naval warfare, you look at the Essexes and you're just like... Hmm. What? Like, how many Essexes in total? It was something like 23, 26 planned. Like, 18 Yeah, it's, it's, well, it's, 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 it's well over two dozen. It's it's a bit silly. Like <laughs> I look at the number, like the Essex class in terms of capability is one of is like you said about Zakaku, like Zakaku. Mm. The Essex class is one of those things where you just look at them and you go, "This is as good as a carrier is going to get right now. We can build." Mm. And then when they they keep them going well into the well the latest one USS Lexington, shout out mm -hmm. to the guys down at CD Fifteen, um, because they are very close friends of my mm -hmm. friend Scott, um. The Essex class, like, Lexi was retired in 1991, as far as I recall correctly. She was the training carrier until the 90s. And then she was replaced by Forrestal, if I recall correctly. I think it was a Ranger, a Forrestal class. I may recall Ranger at some point being a, the tra like the, the Forrestal class or Kitty Hawk class Ranger was a training carrier at some point. But yeah, you get the general idea. The Essex is the Essex is one of the most produced capital ship class, I think. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, because even even pre dreadnoughts were produced, like even the the when the British started spam pre dreadnoughts in the eighteen nineties, they're still in classes of like eight, seven or eight. Yeah. Yeah, you don't get capital ships produced in classes of a couple of dozen, unless, except for these these things. Unless Murica. Mm. I mean. I, I, I kind of like in this picture. There's like that that glove being thrown. It's like it's throwing. Essex is throwing the gauntlet down. Uh, yeah, <laughs> she... and, and the rest there is just like yeah. There there isn't any reason not to at this point because it's the Essex class. We'll win. Like this. Yeah. Like so we've got so we've got uh, Bunker Hill, Shangri La, Essex, mm -hmm. and Intrepid. There. Um. Moving on from her, it, it's time we've given a lot of focus to our colonial friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's time we bring it back. We bring it back to our people. We're mm -hmm. going to wind it back to the most interesting concept in the Azure Lane universe is that the Royal Navy has a focus on being quintessentially British and everything is mm -hmm. royal in the name. So here we go. Queen Elizabeth class battleship. Mm -hmm. Queen Elizabeth. They got crown. <laughs> With the crown. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the Tower of London and the Crows. Yes, yeah. I like this. Yeah, this is a very... This is fan art I actually quite enjoy of Queen Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. So, Queen Elizabeth, her rigging and stuff seems accurate in the anime itself, mm -hmm. but thoughts on the character design? Again, I, I, I actually genuinely like the, the costuming. Yeah. And the, the general characters. It, it's very... I mean, obviously it's similar to hood um yeah that's 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 pretty pretty nifty i mean obviously in this case you're not seeing any of the guns or anything so it's just the person but, but such is life but the but you see what is what is quintessentially british how how will the royals be supported well every mm -hmm. every royal household has its designated household staff so here she is <laughs> HMS Belfast. HMS Belfast, you recognize her. You knew it straight away. Yeah. Uh, someone you're already familiar with, I imagine. <laughs> it does show up a disturbing amount on the in the uh, confinement area of the of the <laughs> Discord. Yes, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Yes. Um, HMS Belfast, the only surviving World War II ship of the Royal Navy. Um, mm -hmm. I would assume you visited the surviving cruiser. Yeah. I would assume you visited more than once. Oh yes, venturing yeah, into, yeah. venturing into London is a brave act these days. We know, but <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. I mean, like the thing is, because from where I live, I just get on the train and wait till it gets to London Bridge. So it's relatively easy for me to get to Belfast. It's probably the easiest museum ship for me to access, actually. But of course, uh, I'm gonna bring it up for I'm gonna bring it up for my homeboys. Because we all know that the maid core has one superior 
member. <laughs> HMS Sheffield, thank you very much. Lots of shiny steel. Yeah, Secret Agent Sheffield, that's her. She used uh, the 007 of the Maid Corps mm -hmm. in the Azure Lane Cannon. And she has a reputation, as her war service would suggest, that of all the Maid class ships, because they are. There is a huge number. All the cruisers are maids mm -hmm. in the Royal Navy, I believe. Um, she is the one not to be fucked with. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> given, as I said, I I don't think I think after I think it was after Ark Royal decided to torpedo her or try to torpedo her. She decided that that mm -hmm. wasn't that wasn't on. Yeah, um, we're going rapid fire now. We're going mm -hmm. rapid fire. So here we go. Well, that's Masashi. Mm -hmm. Really, this one mm -hmm. here. Azure Lane is a bit of a different idea to the cap the super capital ships as opposed mm -hmm. to Kantai collection, as you can probably see. The super capital ships in the uh Azure Lane world are a lot more ornate and a lot more sort mm. of the Japanese capital a ships especially. A lot of metal. I mean I don't think anyone needs that many katana. No, <laughs> you don't think so, but if you think she's she's bad, um you've got uh Shinano. She mm, the giant carrier. Yeah, the giant carrier. The Shinano is rather interesting. Actually. It's the one we get asked about a lot, which is What if the Yamatos were turned into carriers instead? <laughs> mm. Any merit to that, you think? I mean it's a big hull. It's a um, big, lots of planes. Lots of lot, theoretical potential. I mean, they turned her into they. Shinano herself got turned into this kind of support carrier, so her air group was actually really small. Um, but that's a product of no pilots. No the, 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 the way. <laughs> well, yeah, and also just the fact that as I say she was turned. She was turned supposed to be this kind of um, rear echelon ship that was mostly mostly concerned with repairing aircraft and sending other aircraft forward to the frontline carriers with a small relatively small air group of her own to uh provide combat air patrol so you you never get we've never got to see perhaps what a full fleet carrier conversion of a yamato class would be like um it would be interesting though because you know although the yamato's displace so much and they are so large they're actually slightly shorter than an iowa yeah the, the awesome. iowa is actually but they're they're much chunkier which is where the displacement comes from so a lot of hangar space yeah it'd be interesting to see just how many aircraft you could fit in a well done yamato conversion i mean you'd probably i mean given the, Yam the yamato was like prevented from you know it would be useless for a trans ocean navy because you ain't getting through the Panama Canal with that thing. Mm. Um, why the Nimitz is economical in its space. Mm. You could probably fit a larger air wing than a modern Nimitz in a, in a Yamato fleet conversion, at least in scale. But... Yeah, I mean, because the World War II aircraft are a lot smaller. But, I mean, the, the, the funny thing is, actually, when it comes to aircraft carriers, there seems to be, even nowadays, there seems to be a hard upper limit to yeah. how many aircraft you can operate off an aircraft carrier and coordinate and it's more to do with your just your rate of launch than anything else because the essexes in theory could carry over well over 100 aircraft but they usually operated with 90 or so because it was just too it was just too hot too difficult um room you definitely want wiggle yeah. room when you're doing uh, Launch and recovery. And when, yeah, and when the when the midways were launched, in theory, the midway could carry well over 120 aircraft. They tried it and went, it, 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 we can't operate this many aircraft. By the time, you know, it takes forever and a day to launch them all. It's a complete logistics nightmare. Co trying to coordinate 120 aircraft in the sky is just, from one carrier, is just no. Um, and so midway for a while, at least until jet aircraft start to you know, ramp up their size and take up more space for a while, midway is a really nice carrier to be on because, you know, you've got just under a hundred aircraft in the strike group, but they're not, they've got a lot more space to work with. Um, and, and even to, as I say, even today with things like the Nimitzes and so forth, uh, and the Fords, they're still operating at that kind of plus or minus a little bit on the hundred strong 
maximum air group and a little bit less in peacetime, simply because the coordination task becomes a problem. Um, so when you're looking at something like Shinano, I think I'd probably, I mean, okay, it's wartime, so it might just be a case of carry spares uh, for when your aircraft gets shot up. But if they'd been thinking about this pre-war, then I'd probably fall back on the same kind of thing I say when people ask, well, what if HMS Incomparable was built and turned into a carrier? And as you say, look, at, at a certain point, you're going to hit a rate, diminishing rate of returns with single-engined aircraft, but you're going to have an aircraft carrier so big, you can probably start looking into twin-engine strike aircraft. So you're maintaining your 100 aircraft strike group, give or take a little bit, but those individual aircraft are bigger, faster, and more powerful. You'd probably start a single-engine fighters for maneuverability reasons, but you might have you know, a twin-engine torpedo bomber that's carrying a couple of torpedoes, or a twin-engine um, twin engine dive bomber that's able to put a, easily carry a 2,000-pound bomb or a couple of 1,600-pounders and so forth. The Grumman Tiger, ta tiger Cat. Mm. Um, what else we got? I'm running out of ships. I'm looking here. We've just about covered everyone. Uh, actually, no, my friends will get mad at me if I don't at least bring them up. Here we go. Here we go. You'd probably, you'd probably... South Dakotas. Yeah. So you've got Washington in the front. You've got North Carolina behind. And you have South mm. Dakota off in the corner there. Mm-hmm looking all rather excellent with their mechanics yeah any comments any thoughts i got flint certainly got the firepower element going <laughs> I, I think they've, they've actually got the characterizations relatively well relatively relatively you know relatively decent actually because when you say you're Washington, North Carolina, South Dakota, it's like you look at each of them, it's like, yeah, I can immediately see why why that character is named that yeah, way. Like, they, they've they, got the, the... The Native American, they do this thing where mm. if it's a state with a Native American name, they often mm -hmm. have a Native American character as the ship. Yeah. So, uh, like, you have, um, like, Sodak there. You've got a couple of the mm. others who are the same. Indianapolis is one as well. Um, mm-hmm. We've got, I promised I'd bring out the favorites. I'm going to bring her up because everybody loves her. Everyone's favorite tomboy. Mm. You'd probably be able to Repulse. tell by the guns. Yep, there we go. Repulse. Yeah. See, we're winning with Drac. We're winning Drac over slowly, guys. We're winning them over. We've got Repulse here. Have I missed anybody? Um, Actually, I have just about got everyone. I think we missed out on her because I accidentally clicked away to Musashi. Mm -hmm. so I'll bring her up here now. Yeah, another sword carrying one. Yeah, you'd probably be able to recognize just from the turrets. <laughs> you, well, yeah, and the badge on top is Prince of Wales. <laughs> yeah, Prince of Wales. I must admit, I do really like Prince of Wales. Especially here with the mm. a, a, the, uh, the Royal class battleships, so King George and Prince of Wales, mm. they all dress in royal garb and wield mm -hmm. swords because, of course, they do. Mm -hmm. Of course, they do. Of course, they yeah. Do. Must have. And I like they've got the quad turrets, the twin off there on the side. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty snazzy. And finally, to round it out, one more ship girl for our troubles. Where is she? He is... There she is. Back to our Kantai collection, friends. <laughs> USS Iowa. <laughs> Just... America. Yes. And because my friends will never forgive me... The Clevelands. <laughs> Attack of the Seagulls. Attack of the Seagulls. Look... As an Aussie, I can confirm. Definitely, definitely an occupational hazard down here. I don't know if it is mm. in the UK as well, but... Oh, yeah. Yeah, seagulls, <laughs> seagulls will stab you if you don't give them their chips. Yeah, any, any chips on the seaside belong to the seagulls. Just a, they, I have seen a flock of seagulls. Yeah. Uh, not the band, but I have seen a flock of seagulls um, rob a three-year-old of his Happy Meal once. 
Like, they <laughs> attacked him. Like, they're vicious. Yeah. So, I'm going to return us back to our cover image. Mm. I'm going to return us back to our cover image. We started at what? Like, 10.30 my time? So, like, uh, 1 o'clock your time? Something like that, Never. yeah. And it is now 2.30 in the morning. Good lord. 5 o'clock here. We have been going for a while, so I think four mm. hours is a good cap. So it, this is a this is a, a collaborative dry dock. We'll call it Col dry dock on another channel, yeah. basically. But we'll return <laughs> us back to Enterprise. So yeah, right back to the start. We are um, the only thing really left I have to talk about is mad appreciation for Drax's shelf. Absolutely <laughs> insane shelf, like iconic shelf. Mine is not nearly as mine is more thematic, but it is not nearly as ornate. That and this, <laughs> this shelf is not strong enough. I need like a whole set of casing. The only problem is there's more room. I need to yes. I need to make more room. But the only problem is all my all my aviation and like military history books are in here, along with my mm. mum's PhD stuff here. So all right, I need to I need to clear that out. Um, but yeah, so that's just about it. Thank you for coming on, Drac. It's been a pleasure. No worries. Um, Thank you. Absolutely outstanding collab. Um, a, f a, a, a YouTube friendship is born, as they say. <laughs> but I have, but I have one question, and you know no. what question it is. You are on an anime history channel. You know, what question this. Is. Best girl. It's the age-old question. The, anim the weaves oh, no. need an answer. <laughs> the weaves need an answer, man. You've reviewed our cast. I mean, there's probably more out there if you want to dabble on your own time, but you've reviewed the cast. You have mm. to pick best girl. It's the rules. Rules. Yeah. I think the only one, I, the only one I, well, that's not the only one, but probably one of the few that I could pick without immediately feeling like I have to turn myself into the local police station um, would be Hood. Yes! Vindication! Thank you! Mm -hmm. Thank you! <laughs> Drakinafell certifies Hood as best girl. You can all suck it. I win. <laughs> I'm gonna put up the victor on the on the on the board here. Ladies and gentlemen, Hood is best girl. Where is she? There she is. Mm -hmm. There she is. Gonna give her full screen for the for the winner's title. There she is. Vindicated. Vindicated. Yep, you, you can go now. You lost. Lost biz mark, sorry, biscuit. You you gone. Lose. Who is best girl? It's it's official. The king of naval history YouTube has spoken. <laughs> um man, like there's 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 tons of jokes about armor penetration coming our way already. Um <laughs> gonna make a magazine explode, etc. Look, the innuendos can go for days, but the point is Naval History YouTube has its answer. Who is best girl? There you go. <laughs> there we go. That is the best. That is the best result. This is the best result. Mm. And <laughs> you've opened a can of worms now. You do realize. Probably yes. Yeah. Oh well, it was going to happen sooner or later. You had to. You had to face it. This. This mm. was the demon you had to face, and now you've you've overcome mm. it. I can't remember his channel, but I want to plug him. The guy you do collabs with about Star Trek. Uh, Venom Geek Media. Venom Geek Media. Mm -hmm. Check him out if you're as Trekkie like me, because Drac moonlights as a Trek aficionado on the off days. Yeah, as a Star Trek. Fan. Yeah, we're gonna, gonna have some time. <laughs> <laughs> what were your thoughts on Strange New Worlds, by the way? Um, I haven't been able to watch it yet. Um, I need I I need to find some way of watching it in the UK because. As far as I'm aware at the moment, the only legitimate way to watch is to get Paramount Plus. If they've even released it, Paramount what was was it Paramount Plus or CBS Plus, whatever it was, mm. the um, their 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 own personal premium streaming service. The the really dumb thing was they launched Strange New Worlds with it as kind of the front runner for this service, and then didn't bother to launch the service outside of the US. Mm. Um, and then I don't I to the point I genuinely don't know if it. Uh, if it's actually come to the UK yet or not. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I'm not paying for an entire premium streaming service for one show. Yeah. So and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait for it to either show up in some way, shape or form, or I'm going to wait for it to get for someone to get broadcasting rights. 
politically correct answer from Naval mm. History YouTube. That's right. Not that Naval History would provide any other methodology for watching Star Trek, but I understand. That, that's mm -hmm. the rules. We are, we are the Royal Navy here. We do not condone such activity. We catch people who do that. So don't do no, it. No, there's, there's, there's the Good Conduct Medal I've got to earn. Exactly. A.K.A. the uh, the Undetected Crime Medal. The Undetected <laughs> Crime Medal. The gong, as it were. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Man. Well, that's it from me there. It's, that's it from Drakinafel. Mm -hmm. Four hours of uninterrupted naval history nerddom. You're welcome. Yep. Mm -hmm. You're welcome indeed. <laughs> all right. Close it all down. Oh, boy. <laughs> there we go. Mm -hmm. See you guys later. Bye from Pac-Man. Yeah. Bye.